Disclaimer, we'd like to note before the start of this interview that the opinions about to be expressed by the guest on tonight's Get and Sell the Experience podcast are that of the guest and do not directly or necessarily reflect the views of the host of the Get and Salty Experience. You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. Indeed, you are, and normally there'd be a long greeting, a hello tonight, oh. but unfortunately, our colleague wow. Kevin Kugler is down and out. He's not feeling too well. So, wow. I, oh. MC Mike Cologne, stepping in tonight. I Welcome see. back to episode 184 oh, of the Getting Salty wow. Experience. Joined tonight by the incomparable Anthony Gonzo Gonzalez and Louis Rafano. Good evening, gentlemen. Wow. Do you do you hear that, Lou? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, oh, yeah. who's been out in the sun too long today i think i don't know what yeah. happened <laughs> yeah he can also Mike, speak spanish now too nice jo- yeah and he speaks spanish too great yeah he's, oh, is that man. what it would be like gons this is like, what it would be what, that, yeah to be I, like I, a human being like to come on the show and act like a human being the get and the experience podcast we bring the kitchen table to you you see how that, yeah, that was I, I, it's wow. nice I mean, it's really quiet right now. I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's very nice. Oh, I'm not very used to it. I'm kind of cool. Actually, with actually me, me and Coobs were, uh, we were in Long Island at the show, uh, the, uh, the Fire Expo, Long Island Fire Expo. And uh, so I just want to give a little disclaimer to the 8,000 people that he shook hands with and hugged <laughs> and, uh, and signed their hats and all that crap. So uh, there's going to be a lot of COVID cases probably in Long Island, I guess. I don't know. Oh. Man, there's, there's going to be a little something. Right now, someone's going, you dick! <laughs> <laughs> the vid. The vid, uh, for sure. But uh, So how the show was good, though, otherwise? Yeah, it was good. There was a lot of guys there. We ran into a lot of uh, friends, guys in the chat, all that. We had uh, guys from Rescue 2 out there. They had the uh, pipe band out there. They had just – there's a lot of FDNY guys there, obviously, so it was good to run into all those guys. So, uh, yeah, Coobs actually bought a uh, – rescue two shirt you know helping those guys out he got the schmedium again his nipples were like hanging out of his shirt again and you know so we had that going for us which was nice hopefully he didn't give them a parting present uh i don't know (laughs) look at look at mike's face (laughs) (laughs) it's nice to have a little a guy in a suit too you know i like it i like it it's a little warm i don't have the jacket on tonight it's all all right it's it's all good it's nice today i gotta say it was pretty nice today yeah What's it sixty not up there right now? It's uh, no, it's it's low forties, but it's sunny. It's not chilly. There's no wind. It's for this time of year in New England. This is perfectly fine. We're doing a good old sixty three degrees right now. Yeah. Sixty two. Yeah. I stand corrected. Hope the air conditions on your neck. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a little chill. My wife said, "Can you put the heat on?" I said, like, "Chill out of the house." I'm like, "Okay." Look, look at what Paul Mazza said in the chat. Oh, oh boy, let me see. Is he giving us any? What does he got? No, he says, he says, I thought my volume was down. It was so quiet. Oh. <laughs> there you All right, so what do we have? We got two ads today? What do we got? Yeah, we, we get uh, – well, the third one we'll do later on when we do the old school tip. But, yes, we have our uh, – our first one is to knock it out. We got Armor Tough. Armor Tough Firehouse Flooring was recently installed in Station Number 7, the newest of the DeKalb County Fire Stations in Decatur, Georgia. Meeting Deputy Chief Smith of Support Services, Vince explained that Armor Tough Interlocking Flooring is the only floor that is tough enough to withstand the abuse of fire apparatus, along with fire personnel at a very busy station. Chief Smith explained, The flooring in all of our stations over the years gave us multiple problems. We need a floor that can last as long as the walls and the roof. That's why we chose Armor Tough. The installation team came from New Jersey, and in three days, they had completed their work without any disruption to our daily operations. We were very impressed with not only the product, but with the workmanship as well. I highly recommend Armor Tough for your station's floor. Call Vince today for a no-obligation quote at 908-917-7697. Those are some really, really good flows. So I got, I got to say this. So Vince was there. He was across from us, <laughs> and uh, and he did take. He took us out to dinner, and uh, so oh, okay. it was pretty funny. As soon as he, as soon as he comes over, he's like, uh, "Hey boys, I just want to let you know, I'm 
I haven't been busy. I've never been busier. Something like that, right? Me and Coos, without even blinking an eye, we look at each other. We're like, price is going up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's um, that friction coefficient. Baby. That's it. There, <laughs> friction coefficient. Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah, for sure. That Procaccini was there, too. Good man. Oh, did Very he bring man. his old lady for you? He did not. Uh, so, yeah. You were respectful enough. for that. Oh, yeah. We'll find that out. All right. Let's hear from our friends at New Jersey Fire. Knock that out so we can get our, our man in here. Established in 1930 and under the current ownership since 1987, the New Jersey Fire Equipment Company handles a complete line of fire department equipment and supplies. Headquartered in Greenbrook, the company operates full 3M Scott service facilities in Ridgefield Park and Toms River, staffed by 10 fully authorized Scott certified technicians with a fleet of six fully equipped service vans. All New Jersey fire technicians and sales representatives are active or retired firefighters, officers or chief officers, career and volunteer. They understand the business and the importance of their work. New Jersey Fire has represented Scott since Earl Scott entered the SCBA business at the end of World War II. Among other leading manufacturers represented by New Jersey Fire are Globe and Firedex Turnout Gear, Mercedes Hose, Task Force Tips and Akron Brass, Hygienol, Fire Hooks, Arctic Compressors, MSA Carnes Helmets, ChemGuard Foam, Alkalite and Duo Safety Ladders, BA Face Shield Protectors, Truckman's Choice Saws, Groves gear racks and washer dryers, SuperVac fans, RPI, Streamlight, and many others. A New Jersey incorporated and based company, sales and service are limited to the state of New Jersey. Find us now at www.njfe.com. That's www.njfe.com. Yes, New Jersey. Remember, uh, Quick squirrel moment. Remember when I told you that photo about my old ladder company making it back to 127? Yes. I found the photo. Wow. Look at that so, beauty. For those guys out there, that this is what I was talking about. When you have the uh, old FDNY rigs that have come full circle. This was uh, this was a nice pick here. Obviously, after 9-11. I just want to share that with you real quick before we, uh, we do the deed here. All right. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. All, All right. right. Coming to the stage. FDNY, Rescue 2, Lieutenant Paulie Solman, our boy. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Hey, you are welcome. Looking good, Paulie, as always. Still good got the hair, too, baby. Yeah, at least he's here. Yeah. A little gray. A little gray. <laughs> a little gray. But it's there. Uh, at least we, you have it. It's there. I saw, some of the, I saw some of the early pictures. It was a little darker. There's no yeah. doubt about it. <laughs> oh, it yeah. Well, I got it. Yeah, for a little sure. gray in the mustache, too, now. Yeah. My wife likes it, though. It's all right. Yeah. Distinguished. Yeah, it's a distinguished look, man. That's what I tell myself, you know. <laughs> All right, Mikey, you ready? Can, can I say it? one thing to start? Can I say Absolutely. one thing to start? My Absolutely. brother from Little Village, Kevin Kubler, left me on the fucking fire floor. <laughs> 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 oh. Kev, Little Village, man, you left me. You know oh. what they say if they leave you on the podcast, they'll leave you on the top floor. They'll leave you on the <laughs> 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 Point taken there, Paul. He, he, in his defense, he's not doing well today. He uh, he was uh, thrown up all day. So it, all, you, all you knew it. You knew it had to be bad for him not to be here. No, I know. I'm kidding. I hope you feel better. Hope you yeah, feel better. This is, uh, this is a first. He just fell out of bed when you just said that story. <laughs> I just heard it. He's crawling. He's, he's crawling to the mic. Out, <laughs> he's gonna call in. He's crawling to the mic. Right it's now. Not too late. Oh, Come on, Kevin. We'll phone a friend later. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but uh, before we get too crazy, we gotta do get patriotic. Yes, sir. All right, so here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very nice. Very nice. All right. You ready, Mikey? You want me to do it? Yeah, no, I can begin. So before we get into your career, Paul, and everything that encompasses it, where'd you grow up? Where did it all start for you? I was born in Queens. And then in the second grade, my family moved out to Levittown, uh, right by McGuffer High School. 
So that's where I grew up in Levittown. Did you have Again, family on the job, Paul? I knew nothing about the fire department or the fire service, nothing about it at all. Not one thing. So how did that all uh how did that start to you know work out to itself? Did you I have came out of high school? To... I came out of high school. I wasn't really into school. I didn't like school. Uh I got a job at a place called the Old Curiosity Shop. It's a bar on the Levittown Hicksville border. A, a heavy duty drinking bar, like a really wild place, you know. And I started working there. Uh, my really good friend Roger Sakenis and Kevin Miller, who passed away, they taught me how to bartend, and I started bartending there. Uh, I had a landscaping business on the side, and I was doing good. I was making money uh, in the bar. A lot of guys were taking the PD test. I took the uh, NYPD test. I took the Nassau County Sheriff's test. And then one night, about two in the morning on a Saturday night, there's a guy that used to come in from once in a while from 111. He comes in one night, two in the morning, and he, it was paper applications, remember back then? And he throws yeah. the application on the bar and he says, fill these out. It's the greatest job in the world. And that's it. I filled out the application <laughs> and, I, and I took the test. And I knew nothing you about the file. Do you know how many times that's been said on the show where a guy – has the impeccable career, right? And and that's how it was done. It was thrown a paper a, a application thrown on the bar, yeah. or some guy your neighbor three doors down who you didn't even really know. We just, you know, it it happens like yeah. that all the time. It's really crazy. Well, it was a, it was a, it was a complete fluke, and you know that's I was thinking, crazy. I was thinking PD or, uh, and I got called for the PD right after I took the fire test. I did, but the guys I'm working with are saying you're making a lot of money. You're going to go through a six month academy and then you're going to go right on the fire department. And then I'm like, yeah, you're right. So I, I, I put it on the shelf and I kept bartending, but then the lawsuit kicked in with the women. So now I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And then in 1985, the Nassau County Sheriff's department called and I, and I took that, you know, I took that job and that's Nassau County Sheriff is correction officer. So I worked in the jail. No mm -hmm. shit. What was that like? <laughs> we got a picture of that, right, Con? Uh, I, we do. I, I was just waiting to make sure to bring it up at the right time because I, I don't want yes. Mike to go. <laughs> <laughs> Mike loves cuts. That's 1985. I got the yeah. mullet look, and uh, I was getting sworn in as a sheriff. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Man, you have changed big time. Since what? Uh, yeah, nice mustache. What? Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was the 80s. That's what we, we all had that, right? And the mullet. Yeah. You have a mullet back there? You can't tell. I have a little mullet, a little long in the back. And I would say that is corrections. It? Yeah, I guess kind of hard to tell. Corrections is 90% boredom and 10% insanity. You know what I mean? So oh, I worked I a busy that. floor. It was a, a mental observation floor. Guys were hanging themselves. You know, they were all full of shit. Their toes were touched because they wanted to go to Nassau Medical Center. You know, the schizophrenics, the, you know, um, seizures, you know, just a lot of fighting and, you know, officers being assaulted. And it's a, it's a really hard job. I was only there for 24 months. So I wasn't there long enough to hate it. But you're locked up 40 hours a week, more like 60 hours because you got to work overtime. And it's it was a tough job, man. I was glad to get on the fire department. How do people do that for like 30 years? Like, could you imagine? It's like, that's going to make you crazy, the, right? Yeah, you got to get off the floor. So when you're on the floors, it's, it's a lot of craziness going on. You go to transportation, you go to recreation, you go to the mail, you go to visiting, but you got to have time for that, you know? And my buddy Roger, who I worked in the bar with, who's six foot three, actually, uh, Lee Seely knows him really good. He'll tell you, he's a huge guy, Roger. He's a monster. He was a great wrestler in high school, super guy. We go to the jail. I go to the worst floor in the jail, and he's so big, he becomes the, the bodyguard for the officers, the, the sergeants and lieutenants. So he's sort of on the goon squad. He only comes up when the shit's hitting the fan, you know? So he had a good gig, Rod. Was it really like uh, you? there were 30 guys to one, like an officer? Like, is that how it is? 24 it is. guys. Well, it's more because there were some guys out in cells. Wow. So like, it was 100 inmates to, to six officers. One officer is always locked in. So if there's a fight going on and you get assaulted, they hit an alarm. And within 60 seconds, you'll have 30, 40, 50 guys on the floor. You might lose the battle. You're not losing the war. Mm. Let's put it that way. You're gonna win. So, if you hit an officer, you were gonna. It was gonna be a problem. So. And then I guess over time, those guys, if they're there a long time, they know that it's not worth to do that because it's gonna be. There are always guys who want to make a statement. 
You know, they want, right. you know, it's it's never right. like the guy that's gonna be a murderer or a hardcore guy. It's always a guy that's he's he's doing short time or whatever. These guys are all on their way to go upstate for life or whatever, or whatever they're going for. So it's it's usually the lifers are no problem. It's the guys that are in between. Right, 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 right. You never know what's gonna happen, you know. So I just did 24 months. It was good. I made money. I got called for the fire department in in, in September of 87. See ya. Yes, yeah, so you were like, gone. <laughs> did you? Uh, uh, so, so, so when you got appointed, when you when you went to uh, probate school, who was in your class? You remember some of the names that were in your Jimmy class? Jimmy Yakimovich was in my class. Uh, Bobby Aponte. Um, yeah, just a uh, Frankie Castellini. I think there's two guys in my class that are still on uh, McDermott in the three nine battalion. Who you would know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think. Uh, Barry, the captain of 165. I think he's still on. Is he still working, Barry? I think he is. I think he's. I think he is still working. He might so, be still. Uh, Probably school was six weeks back then, and I think one week was peace officer training. It was. You're I didn't right. have to, I didn't have to <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. So I would, you know, we had a sweep or whatever we had to do on Fridays, and we did six weeks of Probably school. It was fast, and you know who was in there? My buddy. I should. I forgot to say Eddie Anzalone. And I stood next to Eddie Anzalone, and Eddie Anzalone was great in probate school. He had that great enthusiasm, you know. And obviously, we we worked together later in our careers again, you know. So, yeah. Eddie did you was, feel like by towards the end there? Did you where you, did you have a feeling where you wanted to go? You didn't know anything. You didn't know anybody. No, I didn't know any. I didn't know any better. And I, and I'll say this: once I got in the academy, I shut my life down. So I stopped going out. I didn't want to do anything stupid. Get myself jammed up. The guys that I was working in the bars, you know, things get crazy. I stayed away. I didn't know to ask someone to, you know, go this place, go that place. You know, I didn't, I knew nothing about the fire department, nothing. So I went where I went, and that was, you know, what happened. So, so you went to 34 Engine. What was that like, your first day going in there? Who, who I go to 34 Engine. It's on the west side of Manhattan. A lot of good guys. A lot of probies in the house. Um problem with 34 engine is they don't go anywhere their first year to the jacob javits center they have no response area um 21 trucks and quarters with us they do go through hell's kitchen johnny hopkins was in 21 truck and me and john used to talk i knew right away that like, i go this is not for me like I, nothing against the, the guys the guys were great they treated me great but here's the thing we were in quarters with rescue one okay mm -hmm. so you're watching that right yeah, yeah, that's a, that's where the seed was planted. One thing about 34 Engine, they had a great captain. They had a captain named Al Torrey. And Al Torrey was a, was a ghetto guy who was sort of hanging his hat in 34 because he was going to make chief. But he's the nicest guy. My first day I walk in, he goes, where do you live? I go, Long Island. He goes, you can do 24s. First day. Because he knew the commute was tough. The guys yeah, were yeah, talking to yeah. him. tours. And so, but we're in course at Rescue One. Now, you got... Spanky McAllister and Georgie Krushner and Joe Angelini. You got these old salty war, war dogs from 102. And these guys are going out every night and coming back charcoal. Every night. They're black. They're laughing. They're sweaty. They're having fun. I'm like, I want to be those That's, guys. You know I want to be that guy. <laughs> right. And then I'm starting to like listen to the drills and pay attention to what they're doing. They have O'Flaherty and, and Steve Cassani and Jay Fishler. And then, and then the legendary guy, Jimmy Ellison, is a lieutenant there. So I'm, I'm listening to things, and I'm taking notice. And the younger guys there, they're not young guys, but the younger guys in Rescue One are Hank Millay, who I love. Hank Millay was always great to me. Super Fireman, Eddie Garrity, uh, Ray Brown. Those guys are all in Rescue One. They said to me right away, you got to get out of here. You can't stay here. You know, I'm a very high-strung, antsy guy, you know? So one day I come in, Eddie Garrity goes, I'm a probe. Eddie Garrity goes, come on, go upstairs. We're going to put a transfer paper in for you. I'm, like, I'm a probe. He goes, I don't care. He fills out a paper for me. He goes, I'm going to put in four companies in Harlem, thinking you can stay in the borough. So he puts in for four companies in Harlem. I think it was 69, uh, I, I'm, I think it was 69, 58, 37, and I, won't, I forget what the other ones. Uh, and guys are going nuts. Like you put the paper in your you're a fucking pro. Be like, you know, I'm like, I don't know. Garrity's like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. You gotta get out of here. Don't worry about it. 
the year <laughs> turns now, then you had to resubmit a paper, if you remember, right? You have to resubmit. So this time, uh, one of the guys takes me upstairs and he puts me puts in for four Bronx companies. 45 engine, 92 engine, 42 engine, and 75 engine. Uh, and the, back then, when guys went to Manhattan, usually you couldn't get out for five years. And this, this is a huge turning point in my career now. There's a fire three blocks away on 38th Street, blowing out the windows. I'm on the apron. I can see the fire. 21 truck goes out first two. Rescue one's right behind them. We don't go. We're not allowed to go on the other side of the avenue. Oh, my I, God. I could run there and be first due, but we don't go. Oh so I'm standing God. on the apron of the, of, the, of the apparatus floor watching the fire, and Captain Tory is with me. And the guys, we're all watching. And I said, you know what, Cap? I can't do this anymore. I, I'm going to quit. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, you're going to quit? He goes, nobody quits the New York City Fire Department. I said, I didn't come here to do this. I said, I took a leave of absence from corrections. I'm going to go back to corrections. I don't. I, I can't do this. He goes, don't do anything. Just think about it. And he walks away. Goes up the stairs. I don't see him again for the rest of the tour. I go home. A few days later, I get a phone call from a guy, Brian Armstrong. No he shit. Goes, and there was no cell phones back then. He calls my house phone. He goes, a transfer order just came down and you're transferred. So my first instinct is they're breaking my balls. They know <laughs> I want to get out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm saying, oh, they're breaking my balls. I said, yeah, okay. I hang the phone up. I go to my friend Jimmy Gels' house. Now, Jimmy Gels was, was a city fireman, with, and he worked in 124. Jimmy's a great friend of mine, had a tremendous career. The cap, he was the captain of 289, lieutenant in 112, and a chief in the 38. You couldn't ask for a better fireman, a better guy than Jimmy Gels. I just want to put that in there. I love Jimmy Gels. I go, Jimmy, do me a favor. Call your firehouse and see if there's a transporter. He calls his firehouse. I don't know if he's in 271 or 124. He might have been in the truck already. He calls the firehouse. He says to the house, watch him. Is there a transport? He goes, yeah, I got it right in front of me. He goes, it's probably so many on there. I'm in the third grade. There's a guy called so He goes, yeah, he's going with 45 engine. I'm like, yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get in my car. I zip to Manhattan. I, take, I, leave, I leave a bottle of scotch in Captain Tory's locker. A what a great dude. What a great guy, man. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. Saved a lot of lives on 9-11. Now, I run into Captain Al Torrey later in my career. He's now a three or four-star chief in charge of personnel. Or in charge of the rock. I'm sorry, he's in charge of training. And I woke up to him. I said, Chief, you don't, you don't probably know me, but you saved my career. He goes, I know you. He said, I remember that day. He goes, I, I, he goes, I go, you saved my career. I go, I want you to know something. I did 17 years in rescue too. Because of you. I said, I was going to quit. He goes, I know you. He goes, when I went upstairs, I called the Bronx Borough Command. It was a friend of no. mine. But I got to get this kid out of here right now. He's going to quit. And he didn't have to do that for me. You know Not, what I mean? Oh, I'm but thinking the whole time. I'm thinking the whole right. time he you're saying that. Me, and he saved my career. Like, saved it. I would have made the biggest mistake of my life. The biggest. You know? You know what it so, is? Like, people say things, but you could tell when somebody means something and he definitely picked up on that vibe. And to hit for you know, kudos to him, man. For him to do that, like that's how it was back then, though. Guys really did I take care of the corrections have been indicted. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Being indicted. <laughs> uh, I'm telling I mean, you, that's, he, he's, that's a great story. And then, like, and it was so cool because the rescue one guys were all congratulating me, you know, and they were like, Yeah, yeah, you're out of here, you know. And a flower, he like even said to me, Yeah, hey, go, go, you know, go have a great career. And, you know, John Hopkins was happy for me, and John ended up going to two fourteen, and then to Rescue Three, and had a great career as well. Right, right, right. So, well, let yeah. me ask you, Paul. You know, so you get there, of course, in eight nineteen eighty nine, and you were in the Bronx for a while across a variety of different houses. But as far as forty five and fifty eight were concerned, you were there for a bit. There, and a lot of guys on this show have talked about it. There's Manhattan firefighting, then there's Bronx firefighting, and you're out in East Tremont, and this is quite the area, especially back yeah. then. What were the early jobs that made you say, okay, this is what I signed up to do? I love Mike. I love him. Yeah. So my so my first day walking into 45, you could just tell it was different. Like, you know, right off the bat, the captain had 40 years, 37 or 38 years, Captain Schneider. I know John Newell talked about him. Uh, and I'm working with, like, you know, Georgie White and Tommy Dunn and, and Bobby Straub, who was a big – these guys worked the war years. They were – you know, they worked the, the crazy years. 
And then in the back, we had Joey Calori and Jerry Hart. And these, these guys were hardcore engine guys, you know? And the thing that was fun in 45 engine is there was no assignments. It was first guy to the back step got the nozzle. What? So it, that's right. First guy wow. to the back step got the nozzle. So you had to have the two jump seats. And then we had a lot of good young guys. We had Bobby Aponte and Frank Casolino. I came on with uh, Jimmy McKeon, who was a Golden Glove fighter. Tough guy. Tough guy, Jimmy McKeon. Uh, and was Dennis the Gordon there? Hmm? Was Dennis Gordon there at that time? Nope. Dennis was a fireman in 45, but when I went to, he was in 38 truck. Oh, he, well, he might have been promoted already even, but he wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Truck. I got you. Mm -hmm. And so, and we had, uh, we had great offices in 45 engine. You know, we had um, Tom Jensen, who, who ended up being a, a big staff chief. Billy Hines from the Tin House, one of Galleon's boys, and was an excellent fire officer. And uh, this guy, Mike Heffron, lightning leaves to call him. So we had really experienced guys in the engine. And my first day in 45 engine, we get a job on Tremont Avenue. And I think I had the, the door. I think I was the doorman. It was a bullshit one-room job. This guy, Jerry Hart, who had a lot of years in 45. I'll never forget this either. These are the things you remember, right? Had the nozzle. It's a bullshit one-room job, nothing. He goes, get that new guy up here. Get him up here. You I knew you nozzle. were going to say that. I knew you were going to say nozzle. that. The first run, he didn't have to do that. He, he put out floors of fire, Jerry. You know, we, we did a lot of vacancy. He was, he goes, yeah, I don't need to do this. Go and put the first fire out. Everybody was cool to me, you know. And that's, and I caught more work in the first weekend than I did the first year. Wow. The first week. I knew you, I knew you were going to say, get the kid up here. I knew he was going to yeah, do that. Get that guy up here and give him the nozzle. And he just backed me up. And and the truck, the truck had like super guys, man. Tony Citro, who was a 175, 103 lieutenant, was the captain of 58 truck. Richie Biddles, who was an 82 and 31 guy. Wow. Roger Gagnon, who was, and then my favorite ever was Chief Captain Donnelly, uh, Chief Donnelly, who was a lieutenant then, but he ended up being the chief in the 60th, was a tremendous fire officer, fireman. But those guys, you know. They worked all those war years. And then you got John Newell. The guys that I looked up to, John Newell, he was just a super guy, great fireman, great guy, Dave Berg, Dave Benyak, you know, uh, Billy Pagano, just super fireman, man. Great, you know. You know, there was no rabbit tools back then. Like, these guys were taking doors, and, you know, they just were great firemen. And 45 and 58 is a great place. They're always going to go to fires. Always. They're just in a great location. Oh, it's an eagle, always an eagle, right? Yep. And then I probably the toughest guy I ever worked with, I gotta mention is this guy, Mike Toppy. So Mike Toppy was one of my first lieutenant in 45. He's about six foot three, 245 pounds of steel. He's got a little <laughs> tiny trunken helmet on, a little coat, and work boots. And he came out of the South Bronx truck in the war years. And he would never bring a mask. And he'd be right next to the nozzle, man, like this, like, hey kid. Sweep the floor. My knees are getting hot. <laughs> I don't know how he did. This guy doesn't. He, he, would, he, he was. He would come in and work to work, and we'd be at the table, and he'd be like, "I don't recognize you guys. Wrap your face pieces on. You know, he'd break up walls, and, or you would go to nice. make the and we're like, "No mask, boys. We don't need no mask today. Like you're gonna lung it. You know. So we did a lot of vacant work. So and Mike Toppy was a tough guy, and the funny thing was he wanted to go to the truck. 58 wasn't open, and he ended up going over the 38 truck. But he was a really tough guy. And I remember before he left, his kid came on the job. And I said, hey, Lou, what'd you tell your kid about the mask? He said, I told him he better wear it. Yeah, it fuck yeah. As soon as you retire too, right? <laughs> You're like, yeah. what is that? I don't know what's going on. Here. Oh, like <laughs> one tough, tough dude, man. Tough. I mean, not to wear the mask is one thing. He didn't bring it. You know? So, and... Behind, like behind 45 engine was all vacant buildings. You know, they had tenements, they had frames, they had private dwellings, they had projects. The only thing they didn't have was brownstones. Taxpayers, they they did they they're always going to go to fires, always. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, They've always been in uh, in the tops up there too, right? I mean, all for years yeah. and years and years and years, right? We would be out all night doing ERS, no contact, ERS, no contact. You know, and phone along the truck goes. You know. <laughs> well, like, I, I know exactly that feeling. <laughs> like this in the morning, and John Newell's like this, drinking coffee. Like, yeah. 
I tell I tell the story all the time. McVeigh was in the it, it, two ninety one or three. That there's a doorway that goes from office to office, right? And uh, you know, be like engine goes, and I hear Mike in the truck office going, <laughs> you know. And then I'd come back. I just I throw the, the the ticket on the on the desk, and I would lay back down, and I'd hear you know, boo doo, engine goes, and I hear, <laughs> you know, he would just. And then they would get one run, and they would go. We would go to a job, you know. But then That's you right. have to do a lot. I'll tell you right now: the truck outworked the engines. The Fifty-eight outworks forty-five, just because the trucks are going to outwork the engines, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we go third due. They, you know, they're going to work. Yeah. So, funny shit. You know, back then we stretched our own line too. So if you were second due, you stretched. So you yeah, know, right, was, exactly. Yeah, we yeah, did yeah, a lot yeah. of vapor work, so you always there's a lot of nows of time. You know, we had this guy Patty DeMichael was another really good, good nozzle man. But everybody would get a, get a chance on the nozzle because you're doing vacant buildings, right? And right. one thing the Chiefs didn't want to be there all night, so if it was doable, they wanted to put, they wanted to get put it out because if they were going to towel lot, they're going to be there all night, right? You know, well, you know, so. Yeah, all right, so let's talk cool. about let's talk about uh, the uh, Happy Land job. Okay. What was that like? What, how, how did that all come about? Well, what do you remember early on? Club fire. Um, so back then we were just wearing rubber boots and coats. That's it. There's not, you know, there's no bunker pants or anything. Um, it's about four in the morning, I guess, whatever time it was. We go out to, for a second new guest lead. We're going down with 82 and 31. We're sitting on the rig. Uh, they give a signal. And as soon as they give the signal, a uh, box comes in, 45 engine, ERS, no contact, Southern and Tremont. That's how it comes in. Schofer spins the rig around. Uh, uh, who was it? Tommy Dunn spins the rig around, and the Chiefs in front of us were heading that, that way. And I, we hear the Chief on the hand talking, go, you got a job, boys. You got a job. So, you know, we get, you throw your coat on, you throw your boots on. Uh, we pull up right in front of the building, and there's fire blowing out two doors, two doors right in front of this taxpayer. Um, we get the, the hydrants right there. We have an extremely senior chauffeur. Uh, we stretch a two and a half. It's me, Jimmy Wallace, and this guy, Brendan McKeon. At that time, we lost our fifth guy on the engine. Uh, so there's only four of us. Stretch a two and a half. I take the line to the right door. I give it a shot. The fire blowing out. The, the door is sort of half on the hinges on half off it. On this right door on over here, you can see it was sort of in the way. The lieutenant says, go to the left door. We hit the left door, and boom, I go in. I go in about 20 feet, maybe 30 feet. The fire's out. The fire's over. It's an all hands fire. I'm kneeling on the bouncer now. Like I have the bouncers under my under my legs. I say, this, I got a 1045 in front of me. Brendan McKinnon's a big dude. He comes and drags him out. The truck just climbs off of my back. They find a couple of 1045s behind the bar on the first floor. Fire's out. A couple of 1045s. And then... I'm not sure if Rescue 3 got the heads up and it was a social club, but they came in and Jerry Murtha found a little stairs that went to the second floor. And when he did, and there's there Jerry right there in that picture right there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think sure. Jerry found one's this little stair and then all hell breaks loose. There's bodies everywhere. There's people literally sitting at the table with holding a beer unconscious. There's, there's bodies piled up in the bathroom. And there's, there's bodies everywhere. And what they did was they took this social, this building right here, and they split it in half. And they put a, a floor in, maybe six feet on the first floor and then six feet on the second floor. There was no windows up there. So I think the fire just sucked the oxygen out and everybody was unconscious real quick. I mean, we just drove past there and there's no fire. And just that quick, everybody's out. So That's we started crazy. Got relieved on the engine. Me and we go upstairs. We start carrying people out, and I guess we carried about about fifteen or twenty people. All the, everyone's carrying people out, and the sun started going up, and the neighborhood starts going wild. Everyone's going wild. You know, they get the word is out. Chief Paxson, he goes down. He was the, the battalion chief for thirty-five year. Great chief. I think that was his last job. Uh, the chief makes a decision. Soretta, don't take anybody out. Anybody else out? I'm going to tell you, it was the, one of the easiest fires I ever had. It was an all hands fire. That's all it was. It was all hands, but 87 people died. That that was real. At some point, they breached on the exposure. I think 56 truck and maybe 38 truck breached, and they started taking people out that way. 
But at that point, they just like they call on it. Like that's it. It's over. Like you know, we weren't doing CFRD back then. Like I was going to ask you that, Paul. Is anybody doing? You know, like right away, were you doing compression? Like what were you I mean, doing? We were inside, so maybe they started to like the guys. I mean, there's all it's only no hand. You know what I mean? So right. You don't have that, that many companies. companies. Right. I'm telling you that people were sitting in their chair like this, holding. A That's beer. crazy. I know. It's nuts. And the fire's out, so we get relieved. They send us back to quarters. We get back to quarters, and there's a big chief there, and the building folders on the table already. And the first thing they ask our officer is, what line did you stretch? And Chief Mike Heffron goes, we stretched the two and a half. Okay. And it was 38 trucks, BI district, and they had this guy, Hickson, who was a really squared away dude, and he had a vacated on it for illegal, illegal social Oh, club. it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they were squared away, so they really, they were, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then everybody yeah. starts coming in, of course, you know, now it's getting crazy. Uh, Carlos Rivera comes in, and I remember my officer – Yelling at him, go, you're a fucking scumbag. You took our fifth guy. And, and it was just mayhem. I'm a young guy. I just sat there. And, and the best line is this. So one of the older guys in the truck, we were all upstairs. And they go, who had the nozzle? And they go, Paulie had the nozzle. And he, he puts his arm around me and he goes, you had the nozzle? I go, I go, yeah. He goes, maybe you should go to the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just going to ask you. I mean, all hands. He goes, nah, I was fucking. You know. I, I was just going to say, like, so you're a young guy. I mean, to see, you know, anything, you know, like when we were younger on the job, if you've seen a, you know, crispy critter, you know, like, you know, it, it affects you a little crispy, bit. But they weren't, well, they weren't. No, I'm saying that's, that's yeah. even worse is that you could see their faces, right? You could see everything. Yeah. How did, did it affect you? Like, were you thinking about all that stuff? Yeah, because like, I had seen a lot of stuff in corrections, you know, right. the corrections, and it, it, it didn't really bother me. You know what I mean? Um, we did our job. We put the fire out fast. It was a fast fire. I mean, what yeah, happened was, was the guy, the guy has to fight with his girlfriend. He goes down the block and he buys a dollar of gasoline. She's the coat room girl. And he just dumps yeah. it in the coat room. He lights the coat room on fire. And she walks out the door. He didn't even kill her. Right. And then eventually we pull up and the whole front of the place is gone. But it really wasn't that much fire for a two and a yeah, half. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're already out. We're down the block. And you can see the hydrants right in front of the building. So it was one of the easiest fires that I went to. Nothing was going to change. Like you, you guys couldn't have done anything else. No, no, nothing was going to change for those people, right? Well, we were there from the time they pulled the box in thirty seconds. We were there because we were down the block. We were already on Southern Boulevard. You know, it was one, two, three. It was over, and then it was just a bad result. Uh, what ended up happening is I had some court experience. So they catch the guy. It turns out the guy's sitting across the street watching the whole thing. He watches everybody. They catch him. I had some court experience. So he's sitting in that building in the middle that you see over there and watching this whole this whole thing go down. Um, I had some court experience. So I got called. I testified in the murder trial. So it was the biggest murder trial in American history. So I testified. Dennis Devlin testified. Maybe Jerry Murtha. And I'm not sure who the fourth guy was that testified in the trial. But, and it was... The trial was crazy. People were crying, you know, you're talking about what happened. And it was a very big thing, you know. And uh, they brought me to the DA's office and they, they, you know, they basically said, This is what we're going to ask you. Tell us what are you going to, what's your answer? And, you know, it wasn't a big deal, really. So, yeah, right. <clears throat> this was obviously a major job to catch, especially early on in your career. You only had about three years on at the time. And what's interesting is that after that, there's that come down effect where other jobs naturally are coming in. It doesn't stop in the city, especially in the Bronx. How did that particular job, and you did everything right, as you just said, there was nothing else you could have done to change the fate, unfortunately, for those 87 people. But how did that job affect your approach to other jobs that would ensue during your time in the truck? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it affected it. You know what I mean? You just, it, you know who it affected? It affected the guys who got promoted because they had to do the uh, social club task force. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, those poor bastards, well, I right? Think, I actually used to get guys breaking my balls that knew me. Like, if you put it on <laughs> <laughs> So John knew what his guys were yelling at me. Like, I got to do this task force because of you. <laughs> they did that a lot. Those yeah. guys were screwed, man. They were screwed. Yeah, they had to do the social club task force, you know? So, no, I, I don't think it affected me either way, you know? Just... I had a way more harder fires than that fire, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that was just, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a crazy fire. How, crazy when did you hour. put your When did you put your paper in for the truck? Right after that, was it in already or 
Is that right? No. So that? what happened was I, I did prefer the truck. I liked the engine, but I liked the truck work. I watched these guys, knew all these guys, what they were doing the truck. They're always working. Uh, and what happened was they had a lieutenant's test. So John Newell, Dave Bird, Dave Banyak, Patty Welsh, they got, they must have had 10 guys on the lieutenant's list. So I just went up to Captain Sitcher and I said, listen, I would love to come to the truck. I know you have a lot of guys leaving. Can I put my paper in? And he, and he said, yeah. He said, you could, you could put your paper in. So I put my paper in. And at the time, the captain in the engine left. His name was Joe Schneider. And we got another captain named Jimmy Scarcus, who was a super guy, man, super guy. And I know this was discussed once before, but 45 and 58 were separate firehouses, right? Uh, 45 stayed on their side, 58 stayed on their side. One company cooked, you went and got your meal, and you went back to the other side. You know what I mean? That's just how it was. Um, and Jimmy Scott just was going to come in and change the firehouse, and he was determined to make it one firehouse. And the older guys fought him, but I remember him taking a mall and start knocking the wall down, and he did eventually. We made it one firehouse, and it was just much better for everybody, you know? So I put my paper in for the truck and these guys all get promoted and I got it pretty fast. I go, I went to 58 and uh, yeah, it was good. I, I actually, I was antsy at first because I was so used to going out the door, like 45 is so. Yeah, so now you're not, they're going out and you're sitting around maybe a little bit. I, I went from 5,000 runs to 2,500 runs. <laughs> yeah. Right. So now you're like, Oh, Oh shit. You know, I got it, you know, and uh but I had, you know, you, you have a lot to learn in the truck. I had a lot to learn, you know, and I learned a quick lesson on accountability early on in the truck. We had a taxpayer fire. I'm the junior guy. I didn't check the, the forcible entry saw, and it, and it didn't work right. It, it, you know, it was fine. They, they did what they had to do. But after the fire, Jimmy McCluskey, who I worked with, who's, who's a great guy, a great fireman, he held me accountable. And I, I thought that was good. I liked it. He said, you're the junior guy. It's your fucking responsibility. And I said, you're right. And it never happened to me again. Never. I made sure that everything was checked every tour, you know? And I like that, that those guys hold you accountable. You should, you should be held accountable for your job. You know what I mean? And Jimmy mm -hmm. Mack ended up, he was on the lieutenant's list as well, but he went to rescue four. And I was sorry to see him go because he was a great guy to learn from. You know, he was a great fireman. And yeah, he was an awesome guy. And he, he went to rescue four with EJ Tierney. And then Mac ended up getting promoted. EJ gets promoted. And they go back up to 30 truck. And then I run in with them later. Yeah, you're running them again later, right? I was thinking about that, yes. actually. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm so, in 58 truck. I was going to say, so you're in 58. Did you, did you did you have any stories there? Or did you, like, you were only there for maybe about two years. And then you had yeah, a 41. Just, you know, just, come going, up. just going to fires, you know, taxpayer fires. And same thing, you know, just, you know, you, it's busy. Uh, you have a, you, you learn a lot, you know. I uh, at the time, Citro left, left, and this guy Ed Lynch came in from 31 Chalk, a super captain, was a great guy. Richie Biddles retired, and this other guy came, Steve Cass. We always had good bosses, you know. So, I, I like working in the truck. Uh, I went to show up for school and just you know, normal fires, you're always busy, you know, always doing something, right? You know, no, no big thing, and then. I'm always antsy, you know what I mean? I'm just I'm always chasing. <laughs> so, chasing, I'm chasing, is, I'm chasing. This, this is another change in my career now. I'm working at 58, and I like it. I'm happy at 58. Yeah. I'm thinking of big study, and all these guys are getting promoted. I go to 38 truck on a detail. I'm sitting in the kitchen at 38 truck, and the, the captain there is Captain Keenan. And we're talking about fires, and I said, you know, we're streaky. When, when we get hot, we're hot. And then when we're not, we're not. Then the fires go to... 75 and 33, or they're going towards 42 and or 92, whatever. And, and we're talking, and he said, You want to go to fires? You want to really go to fires? He goes, Go to 41. Go to he, it was engine enhanced engine, whatever the hell it was at the time. 41. He said, I was the captain there. He goes, They're going to a lot of fires. I said, Yeah. He goes, Yeah. He said, I didn't want to deal with the politics and the shit that was going on. Right, 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 right. And, right. He said, so I left. He goes, but Ralph Tizo's the captain there. And Ralph Tizo was a lieutenant in 58 truck. Go see him. So I'm like. Wow. That's a nice little uh, segue right in there, right? So that's good. Right. We got to 41. I see Captain Tizo. He must make a few phone calls back to 58 truck. And he takes me right away. Now, 
the, big, the good thing was that she, Captain Lynn said to me, listen, if you don't like it, it doesn't work out. You can come back. Wow. You'll take your medicine. You'll take your medicine. Yeah, yeah, you're going to take a beating. Balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'll, I can, I, I'll take it. You know, I got, I, I got my balls broken. So yeah, I listen, take that it. happens. That happens sometimes. Guys go out he, and then they don't like it. Not like for everybody. Back. Go down there and see, right? I said, I go down there. And it was, it was fucking great. It was great. It was crazy great. You know, I walk in. First of all, Tizo's the captain. Like you couldn't get a better but guy than Ralph Tizo. He is the from. best. He's super fire officer. He's trying to get guy. him on the show. <laughs> yeah, oh, he'd be good because he's yeah. got a lot of you know. He, he's he's awesome. Uh, yes, they had one house watch. Forty five or fifty. I had one house watch. So I go I'm down there. Um, Steve Garrity's the, the lieutenant there when I first get there, but then he left. Um, John Carroll, who's a great guy, was a rescue one guy who I know, super guy. And the, the other lieutenant was Dennis Baranchik, who's a 19 truck guy. And I walk in there, and it's it's you couldn't ask for a better situation. First of all, you have some old 41 guys, engine guys, Tony the Magna, Neil Halpin, Johnny Hassett, tough, hard nosed South Bronx engine guys, super guys, man. And then Joey Gandiello is there, right? And we're Joey Gandiello is one of my best friends to this day. Has a superb career. Goes ends up in Rescue Four. I'm working with him. I'm working with John Cinderella, Lieutenant. He ends up being a Lieutenant Rescue Three. Johnny Buckeye, who ends up being a Staff Chief. Um, there were so many guys that so many great guys. And then we had three young guys there: Tommy Foley, uh, Alan DC, and um, Alan I forgot DC. the other guy. Oh, uh, Sullivan. Uh, all young guys. We had so many good guys there. Kevin Murphy, tough guy. Kevin McCardle. And it's it's a great situation. So we're we're going to fire, we're going to Harlem when Harlem's busy now. The 12th Battalion's busy. The 16th Battalion is crazy busy. And 41 is right over the bridge. Right? You you, you could fly there. Um, plus all the Bronx. So it's crazy busy. The first year I was there. The first year we had 1,200 1075s and 200 multiples. The first year. That's silly. Oh, well, I, I say this all. I say this all the time. I got to 117 in 1990, May of 93. I used to listen to the radio. I've said this on the podcast. All I heard when the thing was scanning, right? The 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 the, the boroughs were scanning. Manhattan box. One two six two Manhattan box yep. one four three four Manhattan box one two six four. You know, like it was twelve hundred boxes, eleven hundred boxes, fourteen hundred boxes. Occasionally a sixteen, eighteen hundred box. Yep. It was nonstop. Yep. And, and forty one is like in the armpit of the earth over there too. I well, mean, they are really. We would jump over the one four five street bridge and be right. We would. They were third due to sixty nine then. Right, you're right in the bridge. Over over third the bridge. Avenue bridge. We'd be right by twenty six truck, fourteen truck, forty three truck. So. When, when 69 and 28 were really rolling, we just sit on the other side of the bridge because we knew they were going to hit, you know? Yeah. So we would, we would bang heads with 30 truck a lot because we would always work above the fire. So 69 and 28 were always first two. They were just the first two company, you know? So we were, we were up above with 30 truck and, and, and it, you know, we were banging heads and it got a little, you know, sometimes it got tested, you know? Oh. So, uh, <laughs> It, it was the definitely life of the <laughs> Now you just can't leave. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing that I like too, Louis, is that sometimes we would stretch. You know what I mean? We'd pull up and stretch. Right. So right. I like that. Sometimes you would operate as an engine and make it in a, you'd go to the city and stretch a line and you'd use it. You know, and we, back cut then, a lot you were, we did a lot of roof work. We were working, you know, doing a lot of roof work. Look at that head of hand. You know, you're doing a lot of searching above fires. Uh, <laughs> and and Tizo, Tizo was great, man. We would drill on fire. So here's the difference: the squad that this is the squads in the old days. We did no emergencies, none. There, there were there was no emergencies. We only went to fires, and then the bullshit hazmat responsibility, which was nothing. When they talked about us going to emergencies, Tizo's like, "We're not doing that. You know, we're going to fires. That's what we're going to do. We're going to be a fire company. We drilled on fires." Always, always about fires. Um, it was never talked about the emergencies ever. And the other thing that Tizo did was, and this, this, 
was a big thing. I remember this. We had a job one time. We were on the on the front bumper hanging out after the fire, and who comes walking out of the out of by us is Rescue Three. Conrad, Tinney, Brian Styles, uh, I think uh, a couple other older guys, and Pete Lund's the boss. You know, and T we had a lot of young guys. We had those five, six, seven year guys, and Tizo goes, "Come here, boys." Take a look at those guys. Never think you're those guys. Like he slapped us down. Never think you're those guys. No, that's sure. Kyle. That's 20 years and 28 truck. That's Pete Long, you know, like these are yeah, legendary yeah, yeah. guys. He, goes, he said, you're going to be a great fire company. You're going to be a great squad, but you're not those guys. Don't. And, and like, whack, you know, he let us know, you know, and, uh, and I, well, you had a lot of growing home. yet. You guys were still young, you know. Yeah, right, like don't, don't, don't compare yourself to those guys. Correct. Just because you're wearing a patch, that don't mean right. nothing right now. We got a lot to learn. We're doing a lot of work. We're doing a lot of drilling. Uh, we're going to a lot of fires. We had crazy fires. We it was during the crack years. You know what I mean? They were fire bombing each other. We had a, a job one time, <clears throat> like forty three truck. They, they had a guy in a chair. And they taped them to the chair. And they cut his throat and pulled his tongue out, lit him on fire, lit the apartment, and threw him out the front window. So we get there, and the chief goes, see what you can do with that. Like, they can't do nothing with that, chief. <laughs> All right, stretch the line. <laughs> yeah, he's, dead, he's deader than dead, chief. So apparently the guy was ratting out the drug dealers in the building, you know, uh, and they threw him out. Columbia necktie. That is a Columbia necktie. That's right. Yeah. So That's it was so good because we – And the other really thing bad. was, back then, there was only one collapse rate. Rescue three had the only collapse rig in the city. So they're running all over the city with that collapse rig. And when they were going out of the collapse, we said, we hope they don't come back for 10 hours. Like yeah, right. Because you had the yeah, whole thing. That's right. Yeah, hell yeah. You go on that emergency, you go on that pin job, we'll go on the 1075. Based the low when Rescue Four was going down to the Rockaways or something, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So we 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 lo we love that, you know. And uh, yeah, I, I had a great time there. And then, yep, that's Danny Sheridan on the left. He's a chief wow. of the third battalion still. Probably has 38 years. I can't believe Captain he's Tizzo. that old. He's yeah. been there that Captain long. Tizzo. Huh? And that and the guy on the right is a super guy, Donnie Regan. Uh, Donnie was a 174 guy. He ended up going up to Rescue 3, and he got killed on 9-11. So... Yeah, that he was a super guy, man. I love Donnie Regan, tough guy, tough guy. He's that guy who had a, he lit a cigarette after the fire. You can see that like he smoked a cigarette after the fire. Bob, Bobby Gallione wrote ten forty five code dead. Code dead. That's what exactly what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so, funny. I'm trying to think. Uh, after a little while, when, when Steve Gary left. Probably one of the most influential guys I ever worked with for me in the fire department came to 41. It was Steve Louisi. So if guys don't know Steve Louisi, Steve Louisi just retired. In, in my eyes, he's a legendary guy. He's a 290, 103 guy. Uh, he was in right. 41 with me for a year. I became a very good friends with him. Super, super great fire officer. Very thorough. Very squared away. He used to tell me back then. I'm going a 28 truck or 111, 28 truck or 111, the two busiest trucks in the job. I'm going to hold out for one of them. He ends up going to 111 for, for 10 plus years. Then becomes the captain of 44 truck for another 15 years. There's no better guy or better reference or better guy to talk to than Steve Luizzi. I, I love the guy, man. He, to this day, I love the guy. He was super influential in a lot of things I did, you know? So um and chris king came chris king was also you know chris yes great guy became the captain of rescue three chris was a brooklyn guy started in 332 so when i was in 41 louise would be brooklyn 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 chris king would be brooklyn 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 that's funny you say that because guys are asking in the chat why you went to two instead of three and, yes yeah. i'm just asking about and joey gandiello who was a closet Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. <laughs> Joey came out of Brooklyn, you know? So right. it's in my head now. I'm like, you know, because once again, I'm fucking antsy, you know? Antsy, I'm going to right. all these fires, but 
but I'm still in touch with Louise. Oh, 111 this and this and that. And, you know, I'm like, ah, you know, thought about going to 111. That wasn't going to happen. Uh, I said, let me go down and talk to the captain of rescue too. Right. You know, I, you know, it's like, it ain't going to happen, but I'll do it. I'm not, you know, I'll just do it. What can he say? Down, the, captain, the captain's Jay Fishler. I don't really know Captain Fishler. I remember him from when I was a probie in Rescue One. He probably don't, he probably knows I was the probie, and, but doesn't know me. So I interview with him. I figure, you know, there's no chance, but we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe six months to a year. I forget the time frame. I stay in touch with him. For some reason, Downey bumps all the rescues up four guys. I don't know why. Galeone, if he's out there, is going to know why. He'll tell you why. I don't know. I get a call. You go on a rescue too. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> I go to rescue nice. too. Me, Jimmy Sanders, John Driscoll from 105, Kevin O'Rourke from Squad One. Wow. Go to rescue from the Bronx. Extremely intimidating place to walk into, you know? I'm confident, but I'm walking into rescue too now. It's I go into a double group, group. 23 or 24, whatever it was, with this guy, Dave Van Voss. Dave Van Voss is in Rescue 2 now for 16 years. Couldn't ask for a better guy to be with. I'm like blessed. I'm with Dave Van Voss. Nicest guy in the world. Been in Rescue 2 for all that time. The next group over is Richie Evans. Richie wow. Evans is Mr. Rescue 2. The most dedicated guy. Will take the time to teach you everything. The nicest guy, you know, but hardcore FDNY rescue too. The boss I'm with is Gary Howe. I could, I'm, I'm like going into the perfect situation, right? Perfect. Again, hold on. You're going into the perfect situation again. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're hitting the, you're, you're, you're going like this with the slot machine. And now I don't know anybody. So it's now it's, it's just, I'm getting lucky now. You're getting sevens across the board every time here. So I go to rescue two. Bobby the Rocker takes me around the rig. Awesome. He goes, hey, see all this shit on the rig? We're here to go to fires. Don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> That's what he says to me. Like, like, now, I have to do straight tours. When you go to Rescue 2, you got to do straight tours. So I'm working every tour at Richie, every tour with Gary. They're doing straight tours. My first tour is a day tour. My first run, I have oh, to camp, God. is a gas leak. What makes Rescue 2 a unique place is they have 65 or 70 first two boxes. 111's here, 123's here, 120's here, 132's here, rescue twos in the middle. Great first two boxes, working boxes, first two work. Hard to tell. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's the bar. Yeah, no, they're right in the middle. They're perfect. Right. You're in the middle of arguably three or four of the busiest trucks in the On Bergen Street, yeah. On Bergen Street. My first run is a guest link. Okay. Get off the ring like a Bronx can man with a hook, right? I walk in the building behind <laughs> Gary Howard. We're in the apartment. Gary's talking to the to the lady. I feel a tap on my shoulder. It's the Irons man. He has my mask in one hand and my can in the other. And he goes, this ain't the fucking Bronx. Just like that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to get shit. thrown out of here in my first day. <laughs> I'm like... I'm used to being in the Bronx. You know how the Bronx is. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Right back, yeah. In fact, they used to break my balls about the Bronx. They'd be like, after you. No, no, no. No, after you. you. No, after you. <laughs> yeah. Elio used to have a saying, all that ticket means is, gentlemen, start your engines. The second run, this is a day tour now, is a class three on Bergen Street. Now I put the mask on. I got the can over my shoulder. I jump off the rig. I'm at the back. And I see 105 coming the wrong way on down on Burger Street, and they're coming hard. Like <laughs> the outriggers come down. I'm like, it's a class three. Fucking the buckets going up. Guys are running all over. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't see anything. I hear 105 to battalion, 1035. I'm like, okay, this ain't the Bronx. Now this is. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know. Like, I, this is a different animal. This is what Luigi was telling me about. Now, I'm adaptable. I could run to the rig. I could walk to the rig. But I realized on the first day, these boys ain't playing around here. This is turnout. Let's go. You know? So 
I, I caught on quick and I caught a lot of work quick. So I was lucky, you know, that's it, man. Oh, that's I love that place. Iconic house. I mean, it's right well, in the middle of the was, but it was all dumb. But it's a beautiful house, though, man. So we yeah. should recognize right now that today is the day that Louis Valentino lost his life at a fire. And we that got patch on the front door. Him. There it is. That's right. That patch on the front door was was, was paid to Louis. And, uh, yeah. And I, I didn't have the pleasure of working with Louis. I came after he died. But I, I did get to know his family. Me and we would always go down to Mr. Valentino's social club and we would go to like Carroll Gardens and, and those areas. And uh, I can't say enough <laughs> great things about the Valentino family and, and uh, how great they were to us. And yeah, his, his mom used to always grab my, his mom would always grab my cheeks and say, you remind me of my Louis. You do look like you. I was like going to say, him. yeah, you do. He's got this, the hand, uh, hand going. My face and say, you remind me of my Louis, you know, and, uh, oh shit! We we would go to. I'll tell you a funny story. We go to Mr. V. Mr. V is the is, uh, the vice president or the health and safety guy of the Longshoremen's Association. So he had a social club there in Carroll Garden. So we we go to the social club one day, and uh, you know the guys in the apron cooking the sausage on the barbecue, and and they're talking to us. And and Bobby Galeones mentions, "Hey Lou, that homemade wine you have, that's great wine. Like, uh, where can I get a jug of that wine?" And, you, Bobby, you want this wine? He goes, oh, I, I would love to get a bottle. So Mr. V goes, hey, hey, two fingers. Uh, you mind if I give this jug of wine to Bobby? I don't care. We'll give him the fucking thing. He goes, hey, one eye. Would you mind if I give this jug to Bobby Gallion? <laughs> yeah, give him the fuck. So Bobby leaves with a big jug of wine, you know. We're looking at each other laughing. So, yeah, that, that, was, good, that was good times, man. And uh, we could, we'd could we go to Cow Guys and we'd like go to get lunch or something. And every time we would go to pay, they're like, you can't pay. Mr. Valentino says your money's no good in Carroll Garden. No uh, shit. But we kind of stopped going over there. We felt bad, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, Is he still around, Mr. Valentino? No, he passed away. He passed away, yeah. 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 And he was the nicest, nicest man. Like, you couldn't have his mother. I'm, I think his mother, Phyllis, I'm not sure if, if she's if she's still alive, but I hope I hope she is. And, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know. I didn't work with Louis and, uh, I know exactly where I was, though. I was at the ski races, actually. I was just going to say, I was going up to the ski races. I remember I that. At the ski races, sitting next to John Citarello when someone told us. Yep. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you, Paul, you know, it's interesting. When you got there in August of 96, it was Jay Fisher's Rescue 2. He gets promoted to chief in 1998, I believe, and in comes Phil Rubolo from Rescue 5. Now, there was a bit of a history there of Rubolo from 5, but nevertheless, knowledgeable guy, and obviously somebody who – would carve out his own impressive legacy at two. So what was it like going from Fischler style to Ruvalo style? Good question, Mike. Um, I, well, when Phil first came, there was a few guys who had an issue with him over the box thing. Not my business. I wasn't there. I, I don't know uh, the situation. Um, I will tell you that Phil Ruvalo is the best captain I ever had in the New York City Fire Department. And I had great captains. So that just tells you how great Phil Ruvalo is as a captain. I'll get into that later. But I think there were some growing pains when he first came. There was an adjustment. Um, the first thing that Phil did when he came is he brought over Pete Romeo. So if you know Pete Romeo, Pete Romeo is a great fireman. He's a, he's a 103 guy. He went up to Rescue 3. And then he was super tight with Pete Lund. Pete Lund goes back to Rescue 2. Traditionally, a lot of the lieutenants in Rescue 2 were firemen in Rescue 2. So Pete Lund was a fireman in Rescue 2. Larry Gray, Gary Howard, uh, me, Danny Murphy, Tony Errico. We were all firemen in Rescue 2. We all came back as lieutenants. Um, that's Captain Ruvalo there. You? Yeah. That's, that's uh, Galeon. Gregory, Gregory, right. Uh, Steve Sanders. Sanders on the right and Billy Isaac on the right. Oh, I didn't grind. I can't. I didn't even recognize him in there. Yeah. So, I think there was some grown pains with the older rescue two guys, like Bobby, uh, Billy Lake, Richie Evers. I think with those guys. But I'll tell you that a guy like Timmy Higgins, Timmy Higgins, bar none, was the best guy I ever worked with. Like Timmy Higgins was the guy. Not only was he a great fireman, he was a great teacher. He was a great guy. That was. Um, when I had, we, we, back then there was no scuba school, right? We got trained in the company. 
Uh, Ruvalo was a dive master. Billy Lake was a dive master. They trained us to dive. So when we did the qualifying dive, uh, my son was born, so I couldn't go. So now he's born November 26th. The winter comes, um, and I got to do my qualifying dive. And unfortunately, the lake is frozen over, right? And I don't like diving. I'll tell you right now, I don't like it. <laughs> so they bring me out, they cut a hole in the ice, and I'm like, you want me to go down there? Like, okay, so Timmy's like, I'm with, Timmy, Timmy's like, I'll go with you. you know? It's like, like a sub seller. Uh, <laughs> I, go, yeah, I go, if Timmy's going to go, I'll go. So we go down and Timmy's with me the whole way. And we get into this little, I don't know. And Timmy's going like this. He's giving me one of these. And I think he's giving me a dive signal. I don't know. And I'm like this. So we start to go up and I smash my head on the ice. And he's like, he's telling me, watch your head. Watch your head. So I, go, I give him this. I give him this. I go, me, you, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we, we come out i do the pollen dive qualifying dive and that's funny i come out and ruvalos goes to me uh you saw the boogeyman down there huh i go how do you know he goes i was down there watching you he goes my eyes were like this big you know <laughs> <laughs> you know like i was scared out of my mind i'd rather be in the attic of a queen Anne on fire yeah you know? like on fire so, right the one thing about diving, especially with an auger and a, and a dry suit, is you, you can come up, you know, you can come up, but it's on the rice. You can't come up. You got to go where the hole is, you know? Right. So we did the qualifying time. But Timmy Higgins was a special dude, man. He was great at fires. He was great at teaching. He was just a, spe he was a, a special guy, you know? And uh, I learned a lot from him, like watching him. And he, he was like a, a real like, – there were so many great guys there. But – Going back to Ruvalo, he, he brings Pete Romeo over. So Pete is a, is a hard-nosed, tough fireman, you know, and a hard-nosed, tough kitchen guy. So Ruvalo brings him over. He brings over um, Ray Smith from Squad One. And the next guy he brings over, who's as tough as anyone you'll ever meet, is Dwayne Wood from 290. And, and Dwayne Wood... I always like to say about Woody is there's a lot of tough firemen. Woody has another gear, you know, and uh, he's like a brother to me. I love Woody. Uh, he ended up driving me when I came back as lieutenant. Woody, Woody doesn't know the word like, no, we're not going that way. It's enough. He only has one gear. He loves 290, man. Has tremendous pride for 290. That's I'm from 290. I'm from 290. I know um, the feeling. I was just so say no, guys. Those hardcore dudes, and uh, in time, in time, Billy got over it. Bobby became like best friends with Ruvalo. They're like best friends, and Richie was lukewarm about it. The rest of us, you know, we we we, we didn't care. Dave Van Voss didn't care, and that was and none of my business. I stayed out of it. You know? Was it just because he was very regimented compared to the other captains? Or no, it was, was because Rescue Two lost some boxes back before I. Oh, came the there. box that you said that. All right, all right, I got and you. Apparently, uh, somehow you. Bill was involved in that. I don't think like you know what Dave Van Voss told me. He goes, "We used to drive all the way to Bay Ridge." And two fourteen would give a ten. Oh, that was the five. rescue five thing. I got you. Yeah, I wasn't, I, he would say it was we riding. Because it wasn't even. It's the principle of it. You don't want to lose anything. I, get I understand. That. But I, I mean, in hindsight, it'd be one of those things too. Like you're driving all the way down there, you miss a box by your firehouse or something. You know exactly. So Phil Ruvalo, he was a cap, an old school captain, straight tours, no twenty fours. So whoever's opposite him, you're doing straight tours. Um. And he led from the front. And when I mean lead from the front, if we were repelling off a 400 foot tower in Con Ed, Phil's repelling. If we're diving under the ice, Phil's under the ice. He's never going to ask you to do something that he, he won't do. Doing. He knows everything on the way. <laughs> everything. I don't care what it is. He knows it. He knows where it is. Um, he's real even keel. Like, he got mad at me and Woody a few times, but I'll, I'll tell you about those stories. But he's very even keel, great at fires. The Chiefs love him, um, but he just led from the front. And the one thing about Phil is right or wrong, no matter what, he always stuck up for his guys. So if there's a beef with, a, with somebody, Phil stuck up for you, always. There was no gray area because there was times we had covered offices and maybe something happened, he stuck up for his guy. He might tell you in private, uh -uh, no good.
but not in front of anybody. Right? Always right. stuck up for his dad still. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll tell you one story. Uh, he would get these crazy drills going, you know, with ropes and all this crazy stuff. And he has this drill. He sees a, a big, gigantic sewer pipe on the side of Fourth Avenue. And he pulls the river over and he goes, we're going to rig that up. We're going to take that pipe and we're going to carry it. And we're going to put it over the fence. And we're going to, you know, a rigging drill. So me and Woody climb over the fence and we look at this pipe. It's kind of heavy, but I pick up one side and Woody picks up the other. <laughs> we throw the pipe over the fence. The pipe's rolling down do. the fourth <laughs> I walk up to him. I go, Phil. I go, Pap. I go, drill's over. Let's go. And he lets out on me. He's, he's yelling at me and Woody, you two fucking guys get that pipe. And me and Woody are dying laughing. But he loved me and Woody because he had us on both sides of him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Was the mother on one side and Woody was on the other. So, yeah, he, he got a couple of other That's, great. That's funny, man. Funny. Billy Espo wrote Espo all over the firehouse, and Rubelo yelled at me and Woody made us clean it. So we'll, we have steel wool, we'll clean it all the Espos off the firehouse, and look at us two tough guys with steel wool cleaning, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It was funny. Uh, I, but we, one we of the had things I want to a lot of 103. We had Dave Ossiri. Dave Ossiri is a 103 guy, another guy, like a hardcore guy, super fine, and super great guy. Uh, Billy Esposito from 124. Um, we had so many good guys. Larry Senzel was a tin house guy. Um, we had so many great bosses, Gary Howard and Pete Lund. Pete Lund goes, does one works in 120, rescue four, rescue three, rescue um, two, and then um, gets killed in a, in, a, in a volley fire. You know what I mean? And you couldn't ask um, for a better fire officer or a better guy than Pete Lund. Like, he was as, as good as it gets, man. As good as it gets. So, um, and the other guy I worked with, Mesky too, who's my favorite guy that I worked with, was Galeon. You know, Galeon, I went through a lot of fires with Galeon, and uh, I loved Bobby Galeon. He, Bobby Galeon is a great fireman. He's a smart fireman. He, he thinks things out like, um, You'd fight your way to, let's say, the attic of a Queen Anne, right? As the as the Irons guy, and you run into Galleon. I mean, he's the chauffeur. Like, you know, how'd you get up here? <laughs> he just smiled. Like, he took the back servant. To, he was always <laughs> smart. You know, he always had a. He was smart. He always he always knew. Um, when I first got to rescue two, I got in trouble with Captain Fischler at a fire. I did something. He was mad at me, and uh, Galleon goes to goes up to Fischler. He goes, "Is this like a game misconduct, or is this like?" A, you know, <laughs> I was just, just like, you know, what, what's the deal here? So Galliano comes down, he goes, Go upstairs, you gotta apologize to Fishler. I go, I don't even apologize to my father. He goes, Get up the stairs, you know. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you know what I, he always looked out for me. He you always know, looked you know, out for me, Bob. Who I remember was uh Tommy Donnelly. I remember one of the first times I worked in Rescue Two as a fireman. I had to I had to get the door, right? So uh I remember, I, I think it was Mark Gregory said to me, like, listen, you got, when you hit the door, you have to be moving to get to the to the rig. You know what I mean? I guess, to, you know, as soon as the rig clears. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm pretty good. Dude, I hit the I hit the button and I was, you know, like jogging out of out of the fire out of the firehouse on the apron. Yeah. And he was driving and the rig was going. And I'm telling you right now, it took every effort I had, but it was a job. I ended up getting on the rig, but I yeah. never had to do that. You know, I ran full speed. I almost actually, I think probably was so nervous. I, I think I almost probably clipped the rig as it was coming out because I tried to time it too fast, like to, to close the door. That's how fast. Yeah, you, you, had to, you had to be moving. Like Larry Senzel was another guy. Larry, Timmy. Larry was another Tin House guy. He was just an unassuming guy, but he was great at fire, man. And he was great at emergencies. He was such a great guy, but he would pull out full speed. So you had to hit it. Just when it cleared, hit it and, and, and yeah, go. Yeah, you had to hit it just as it cleared is right. Uh, Tommy Donnelly. Tommy Donnelly was one tough, tough dude, man. I'm trying to get I him to. I like Tom. He's 160 pounds of toughness, you know? Yeah, I was, like Tommy a lot. He was a good, he was he's a good a man. He was a really, really good fine in Tommy. Isn't Donnelly. he like a – what is he, he now, a congressman? Tommy. What? Smart guy now, right? He's a congressman or something? What the heck yes. is he? Yeah. 
He went to Rescue One. He had a great run in Rescue One. Right, Lieutenant. Um, great. Good. I tell you, man, Rescue One. I, I have a great respect for the Rescue One guys, man, because they maybe they don't go to as many fires, but they get like some crazy stuff, man. Yeah, all the crazy. They get those Rob, you don't want to go to. We we would so go to rescue. We would go to Manhattan sometimes. Like, we'd go to Manhattan sometimes. Uh, in Chinatown, or if rescue ones out, and we'd be in rescue one man. And you you're out of your element, you know. You're in Chinatown. They got this plywood set up all over. You're in some cellar somewhere. They they got crazy jobs, not like normal jobs. Scary you know? word again. Yeah, yeah. The Keep rescue one, mind. the rescue one man. Those guys. So they get some crazy stuff, you know. I was I never in my comfort zone in Manhattan. No, I agree 100%. I don't think that was ever yeah. in my – Manhattan was never in my uh, wheelhouse to be there oh, all man. the time, you know. Yeah. I, Did uh, you – do we have any more pictures of Rescue 2 before? I just want to – I have – I'm in there. I have the, all the ones that uh, – yes, I have uh, before you move on. We have this one. This story. Okay, so that – <laughs> I Bob, Bobby Gallion is a good cook, so I'm going to impress him one night. I'm going to cook for the firehouse. I'm going to make chicken cordon bleu. So I'm frying up the chicken cordon bleu, and we got two buffs riding with us that night, and we get a run. And uh, of course, I forget to turn the oil on. And uh, we come, Paul Hedlund is a covering captain, great guy. Jimmy Jagged on the left. Jimmy Jagged is a super guy. He was a 230, 26 truck. And Rescue 2 did, had a great career. And Eddie Rawls, the other guy, he got killed 9-11. Another Tin House guy. So we go to this fire. We don't work. We come back. We get another phone alarm in bed I think we go up there. And Bobby says when he's driving down, he thinks he sees, like, some smoke in front of the firehouse. But he's like, ah. <laughs> we, get, we get 10 2 And as we come back and we lift the doors, the firehouse is banked down. You know, like you, it's it's on the kitchen's on fire. It burnt itself out. It just started to get up into the bunk room, and that the wires are all melted. The lights are like potato chips. And Galliano is looking at me like, "Cause I let you cook once." <laughs> all the, the pots were all melted. Plus, the spices were all melted. We were burning off. You know, we were. So we had Tony Erico at the time. He rewired the firehouse. We didn't have a house watch, so the teleprinter was back there. That was burnt off. Like, you know, that's a freaking awesome. Like, I mean, that's happened in a lot of firehouses over the years. I'm I had it happen in 41. Johnny Citarella did it. He was baking chicken cutlets. Yeah. It's the same thing. We're at a vacant building. We're at a vacant building going yeah. after. And we're, we're pissing on this vacant building as an engine. And there's a phone alarm for our quarters. And I said to Steve Louise, there's a phone alarm for our quarters. He's like, yeah, okay. And, uh, all of a sudden, you hear the rocks. <laughs> got three yeah, two okay. in the rescue going on uh, 330 150 Street. I go, Steve, there's three two in the rescue going on our quarters. Now he comes over to the ring, and Chris Corbin was the officer. Engine 50 to the Bronx, urgent 1075. Oh my God. The chief of the 14th battalion immediately. He goes, 841, you want to keep pissing on this vacant or you want to go put your quarters out? So he, Steve goes, disconnect, and we pull up and they're cutting the roof. Like, oh. No, were they really? <laughs> yeah. No shit. The kitchen was destroyed. But the funny thing was now we're, gonna, we're trying to short and we'll say who's going to call Tizo. Like, we got to call Tizo. Like, <laughs> He's like, I'm a covering guy, you know? So oh, shit. who comes walking into this Tizo? Like, you know, someone said, who told you? He goes, ah, I got the heads up. So but what, what was a good thing about it was every firehouse in the 6th Division had us over for dinner. Right? Every firehouse. And we were banging heads with companies, you know, but they were every night they got, we got our kitchen was burnt. That's how the Bronx is. Every night we got a different invitation. And then, you know, eventually the kitchen got redone. Wow. That's cool. Uh, yeah. So I burnt up the kitchen, but it wasn't, you know, <laughs> it wasn't that. So, Could have been. When did you, uh, it's where I wanted to talk about 9 11 and, and the stuff that you had happen, but when did you start studying? We'll just talk about that quick. Were you studying already? I started or? studying in 41. I studied with Joey Gandiello, John Citarella, Kevin Murphy, and Kevin McCall. We had a study group. Once I went to Rescue 2, I put the books away. I didn't study. Obviously, Joey became a captain. Kevin Murphy became a captain. Kevin McCall was a lieutenant, and Johnny Citarella was so. And I, I think I wrote, I did the, the test. I wrote a 67. You know, and uh, I was good. I was in Rescue 2. I was fine. Yeah, right, right, right. I was happy where I was. I didn't want to get promoted. Uh, Galeone used to read books in the kitchen table, like novels. He was a big reader. He was smart. 
And I said, why don't you read those lieutenant books? He said, cause I'm afraid I might pass. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to leave the rest of you too. I, said, yeah, I took yeah, note yeah. of that. Well, maybe he's got something there. You know, but yeah. a lot of guys did get promoted out of rescue too, but they had done a lot of years there. Eventually, you yeah, know, right. changed. Yeah. So, so, so let's talk about. Um, you wanted to touch on nine uh, eleven and what you did and where you are, the company and uh, everything. Oh, so nine eleven. Uh, I'm home watching my son. My wife's a New York City school teacher. She's actually on sabbatical and taking a class at a college. My son is ten months old. I live in Middle Village, Queens. And I'm watching the bear in the big blue house with my son, who's 10 months old. I, I, my wife calls and says, do you see what's going on? I said, no. She said, put on the, put on the TV. I see the World Trade Center gets hit. The first, the first one and the second one hits. I go down to Juniper Valley Park, which you guys know, right? I can see the World Trade Center from Juniper Valley Park. I've seen it. Now I'm fucking frantic. I'm like, I got I to gotta get in. I got to get in. But I got my son. I will tell you, I always tell my son to this day, I think he saved my life, you know? Uh, I'm watching my son. My sister eventually comes to my house. I give her my son, and, and now I'm driving in, and I say, I better go to the firehouse and get my gear. But the time, the flex time I had there, because I live so close, it could have been close, you know? I'm not sure. So I always tell my son, Jake, you're my hero. Yeah, the delay He's, that you had there, right. I feel that. You know, he's been, my, you know, he saved me. Uh, my wife goes to St. Francis Prep, picks up my daughter, Jenny, who's in prep, brings her home, walks in the door and thinks, I'm home. I'm gone. And uh, she doesn't, she, and I, she doesn't hear from me for the next 12 hours, but we'll get to that. I go to the firehouse. Galleon's already in the firehouse. And I think Ray Smith, because I think they were at CFRD. So we're getting our shit together. We're going to go down there. Guys are starting to come in. And we stopped a, a New York City bus. Tommy Donnelly uh, stops a bus. We kick everyone off the bus. To this day, I remember the bus driver's name. Her name is Barbara Bird. Ruvalo says, can you get us down to the World Trade Center? She goes, yup. She drives us all the way down. We get down there. About 10 minutes before we get there, the buildings collapse. Right? We get down there. It's very surreal and quiet. There's fire blowing out windows in different places. They're not letting anybody down to the pile. No one's allowed to go down there. The chief chief, Ruvalo. They say, Phil, get you guys down there and see what you can do. So as we're walking down, you know, it's it's, it's insane, insane. It's like being on the moon, right? Yeah, it's weird. But it's it's quiet. It's surreal. I remember Bobby going, man, we lost everybody. Everybody's going to be gone. I go, no, no, no. He goes, no. Look at this. So we're working and, we, you know, we're, we're working all day and, uh, there's, there, there's, there are guys, Jay Jonas and his men, which is, is going to be integral in what we do now. They survive in that hallway. It's Jay Jonas, his company, Mickey Cross. Some of his guys survive. Uh, Al Fuentes is messed up. They're getting him out. We find our rig. Uh, the rig is destroyed. Um, we work through the day. We work through the day. As far as my house goes, my wife's getting phone calls from everybody. Have you heard from Paul? She's like, no. Everybody else is hearing from their husbands, but I'm just busy. At some point, she, she actually was quitting smoking. She said she rips the patch off, lights up a cigarette, and she's now thinking, my husband, I, I lost my husband. At 10 o'clock at night, somebody had a cell phone, and I called my house. I said, no, I'm alive. I said, but it's bad. At about maybe, maybe 11 o'clock, I'm not good with the times, Ruvalo gets us all together, makes a decision, He's going to split the company up. Um, half the guys are going to stay overnight. Half the guys are going to leave. So I'm in the group of guys that leave. Um, it's me, Davey Osseri, Stan Brzezinski, Tommy Donnelly, Billy Espo, Larry Senzel, Tony Tedeschi. The boss is Larry Gray. We're going to leave, come back in the morning. We come back in the morning. We relieve the guys that were there all night. And we're trying to decide where we're going to go. How, what, how are we going to approach this gigantic thing that's on fire? Two buildings, 100 stories around the ground. And one of the guys says, let's go with Jay Jonas and his guys survive. Tremendous idea. We know, they, where, they, we know where they survive. They hit a sweet spot in the stairs. 
and he survived. Jay Jonas and his men and Mickey Cross and some of his guys. We say, okay. So we start climbing up. We got to climb up 150 feet on a thing that's burning. That's It's, it's a crazy climb. I'm not going to lie. It's crazy. When we get to maybe 30 feet up, there's a chief up there. He says, Nobody, nobody's going up there. And we said, yeah, we're going up there. And he says, nobody's going up there. And him and Larry Gray. And Larry's a chill guy, man. He don't, you know, they sort of get into it. And we just say, you know, we're going. And he had a couple unpleasant treats for us. We get up upstairs. We find the stairwell where Jay Jonas and his guys survived. And by where that stairwell is, there's an elevator shaft. And I start yelling into the elevator shaft. And I hear somebody yell back. Get the hell out of here, dude. So now my first my first instinct is it's one of the guys breaking balls because we don't mean any harm, but you know we always deal with everything with humor. You know what I mean? That's just the way we handle, we cope with things. It's me and Billy Espo. I yell again. I hear clearly a woman's voice. Me and Billy go down a flight, a flight of stairs. I yell again. I can hear her faintly. We go down another flight. I can't hear her at all. We come out, we leave the shaft, and we climb out onto the pile now. Now she's screaming, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. And I said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. What? I go, what's your name? She goes, my name is Janelle. I said, Janelle, my name is Paul. I'm not going to leave you, but I can't find you. I said, can you show me where you are? Stick something out. And out of the pile comes her arm. Out of the pile. So right away, I, I grab her hand. Outside. She's out. She, you, you could see her hand outside. She's, on out, the pile. She's, she's in the rubble. In the rubble. No shit. Buried, though. She's buried. I didn't know this, Paul. I don't she's even know this. Buried, she, she's buried 26 hours, right? Um, the, the fellas Swarmer, Billy Espo and Senzel and Tommy Donnelly, and, and they they get her out. Now, how now the thing is how are we getting her down? In the meantime, Larry Gray gives a transmission that we have a live victim. And the place goes wild. Like we found somebody alive, right? Everyone's going wild, everyone's revved up. What they decide to do, which was a good idea, they make a daisy chain of guys, maybe a few hundred guys. And they, we, we get her in the stoke. She comes out. She looks like she's 400 pounds. I find out later she's a tiny little woman. But she's so swollen and so, you know, messed up. She's a complete mess. She needed a lot of surgeries that she swelled up really, really big. They, they hand her down. And down, down, down she goes. And... We don't think anything of it. We're all revved up. We're going to find more guys. Um, we start looking around. I remember Larry Gray came up to me and he goes, hey, Paulie. I go, yeah. He goes, finally, your big mouth came in handy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we started laughing and stuff. We're still laughing. Um, yeah, that's good. So what happens is we start, now we're, we're looking around and we think we're going to find more, more people. But we're finding dead people. We're finding firemen. Um and it turns out she's the last survivor of the World Trade Center. There was never another live person found. Okay. I didn't even know that story, bro. Right. But nobody knows the story because we don't say anything. We just go about our business. You know, we lose 343 heroes. We lost 105 guys in SOC. We lost eight guys in Rescue 2. We lost Timmy Higgins. We lost Johnny Knapp. We lost Pete Martin, a, a great officer. We lost uh, Billy Lake. You know, we lost Eddie Roll. So we lost Lincoln Quape. We're not thinking we're not, we're not talking about it. We're just going about our business. Um, the World Trade Center, you know, we worked there, you know, throughout the years, about the time, I should say. Uh, and we never really give this another thought. Years later, this woman writes a book. And a bunch of guys are claiming they found her. They're all liars. Two guys from Boston say they found her, they're liars. People are saying they think, all right, the woman writes a book. The name of the book is Angel in the Rubble. Um, somebody told, calls me and says, listen, this woman wrote a book. It's a very spirit, a spiritual, religious book. This is the book, Angel in the Rubble. That's the woman. And the, and the base of the, the book is that she's very religious. She kept praying to God, praying to God, praying to God. And God sent an angel to her. And the angel's name is Paul. That's the oh, kind of shit. Shit. And God saved her and, and found her and everything. And I never really said anything. And me and my wife are talking. And my wife says, well, I read the book. The book's wrong. It's just not 
factual, you know? So I said, okay, let me call an author. I'm going to reach out to the author. The author's, the author's name is Bill Croyle, really good guy, lives in the Midwest somewhere. And I'd say, are you Bill Croyle, the guy who wrote Angel in the Rumble? He said, yeah. I I'm said, Paul. okay. He, I said, you wrote a chapter in the book about Paul. He goes, yeah. He goes, I, I go, I'm Paul. He goes, a lot of people have said they're Paul. That's what he said to me. What? I said, well, I am. I said, well, I am. And Rescue 2 and these guys found Janelle. And your book is not factual. It's not true. He said, I'm coming to New York to see you. Two days later, he flies into New York. Him and his wife meet me and my wife in a, in a hotel in Manhattan. I tell him the story you, you tell him. I said, listen, Janelle got saved because of Jay Jonas. That's the reason. That's the factual reason. Jay Jonas survived with his men and Mickey Cross. I know Mickey, right? That's why we went there. And one of these guys, it wasn't me, had a great idea. Let's go there. That's what factually happened. He said, how did you know her name? I said, she told me her name. He said, she said she didn't. I go, she did. I said, this is exactly how it went down. There was no dog. There was none of the things that he that were in the book. Oh, there was some stuff in the book. So now I tell him the story. He goes, holy shit. You guys are the guys. I go, yeah. He goes, it's 10, it's years later. Why don't you say anything? I said, there's nothing to say. I said, we did our jobs. I said, the heroes of the 343 guys who lost their lives and the next 350 guys post 9-11 who lost their lives. We just did our jobs. And if it wasn't for Chief Jonas, we wouldn't have went there at, at all. So it was a lucky thing. And she was lucky. But so now... It gets very political. She writes this book. They don't want to recant the book. He goes, she wants to meet you, but she's going on a book tour. And the, and the, and the publisher is saying she's not meeting you because she's swearing by what she said. So I said, okay. So as, as, as the time goes by, we do, I do meet her. Me and my wife go to meet her and her husband. She don't say a whole lot. It was very awkward. Her husband does all the talking. And he kept asking me. Why didn't you guys say something? And I kept saying, because there was nothing to say. It was just, this is the way it went down. But it just turns out that, was, you know, she was the last survivor of the World Trade Center. Hmm. So we don't really, you know, we don't really talk about the story, but, it, you know, it, it, it did happen. And uh, she's like, I didn't realize that was the next day, Paul. Like that's 27 hours. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that that, that happened because I had just, it's funny that you say that because I stayed. We did something similar to that where I stayed the night and then I went home in the morning. So I didn't even know any of that stuff happened. You know what I mean? To be honest with you. And then I came back, yeah. whatever, the next day or whatever heck we did. Yeah. I mean, it was, I, was, I mean, I was lucky. I was with my son in the first place. He's now 23 years old. He's a nurse. And uh, yeah, if, yeah. If, he, if I wasn't with him, I don't know how I would have turned Listen, out. Everybody has, I mean, we've had a ton of guys, right? Everybody. Has that story yeah. where either it worked out really, really good or unfortunately it was really, really bad, you know? I mean, I think Eddie Roll, Eddie Roll was off that day. And Eddie had three boys and he would always work overtime when it was available. And I think he, he got overtime and he went in on overtime. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know. They called me on and, Sunday to work overtime and I passed it up because I was working my side job and Joey Hunter, you know, took yeah. the overtime on Tuesday, you know, well, just how. It was just the luck. Problem. I mean, if you were working. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy. Good story. It was really That's crazy. A good story, Paulie. All right, so you get through 9 11, you rebuild the, the company, right? And then, uh, so Phil, uh, Phil uh, rebuilds the company. He brings over John Fowler from 176. Great guy. He's Liam's brother in law. He brings over Chris Carey. Uh, he brings over Eddie Checkier from 124. I spent 20 years in Rescue 2. Um, I'm trying to, he brings over Richie Myers and Richie Myers is a star from 252. Richie's is a cool, cool guy, man. He's, he's really, really good fireman. Um, and he, that was, he, he brought him over. So he's rebuilding the company and we're getting really good guys. He brings over down a little bit later, Kevin Keatley from one set from 157 and Mike Schweiger from 157. Two I got. Super Max 157. They both seated chauffeurs in 157. Um, so uh, those guys come over. Ronnie Broom from 112 comes over. Another great, tough, you know, super guy. 
So he brings over a lot of good guys. Uh, he brings over another guy that's another great guy from 103, Jimmy Gersbeck. Gers. So really good fireman, a seated shoulder from 103. So Phil's going to these different places. You know, it's a, maybe a year or two out. It, was, it takes time to rebuild the company. Um, not only did we lose those firemen in 9-11, but right after 9-11, Joe Jordan gets promoted. Tommy Donnelly gets promoted. Mark Gregory gets promoted. Right, Mike and we're making a lot of guys. Yeah. Look, we lost half the firehouse. Yeah. Half the guys. Yeah. So we we got to start. We're building the company back up. But these guys are all super guys. They're all super sharp guys. Jimmy Gersbeck's a super guy from 103. And these are the senior guys. These are all, they were all seated chauffeurs. They all had, you know, they were older guys, you know, some time on the job in busy places. Um, so we, we build it, you know, we build the company back up. Um, at the time, I, I left out Georgie Hassel. So Georgie Hassel was a super guy. He was a lieutenant in rescue too, a fun guy. He was also there for 9 11. He, so, but they, they split the company up at, at one point into an ABC group. Pete Lawn had a group of guys. Ruble had a group of guys. And Hostel had the group of guys. And Hostel ended up getting a spot in rescue too. Hostel's a 123 guy, tough fireman, old school boss, old school. He is fireman. old school, man. I think he was 136, right? When he went to yep. rescue. Yeah. And he was there for a while. He was in rescue too for a while. Uh, him, him and Danny Murphy were actually opposite each other. And Danny used to say those, those two fucking years. guys, right? Holy yeah. shit. <laughs> I'll get to Danny Murphy later. But, Holy uh, shit, man. So we, you know, we had great guys. Timmy Higgins would have come back to rescue too, is 100 percent That was in the in the you know, I know Ruvalo was gonna take Timmy back. Right. So I told you that a lot of lieutenants in rescue two were fine in rescue two. 100 percent Timmy's coming back. There's no yeah, more right. talent than, than Timmy Higgins. I think Mickey came over for a little while. Mickey got made. He came over for a little while, but he, his heart was always in the Bronx and Rescue Three. You know, I think he was off in the spot. Um, <laughs> Hank Mole said, "Grumpy George." <laughs> yeah, Lieutenant <laughs> Hostile, we used to call him. <laughs> <laughs> he went, oh shit! Yeah, he was. All right, so, so just, let's. We're going to move on just a little. Yep. Just on this one here, we're going to. Uh, so, 2004, you get so promoted. I, so now, I, I take the next lieutenant's test. I buy the outlines. I pass. I get a 72. I have full seniority. I have almost 17 years that I get promoted. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about my promotion. I get promoted. Um, I think it was four weeks we went, right? Did we go to flips four weeks? I think it was four weeks. And I'm in flips. And in, uh, I'm in flips with this guy, Scotty Johnson, from 2.30. We're at headquarters. And uh, we're doing night fish training. They're going to go to computerized payroll. They didn't do it yet, but we get trained. Scotty Johnson says, I'm going to 230. I'm going to uh, the 14th Division. I said, how do you know? He said, Chief Moriarty's right there, Chief of Personnel. I said, okay. I walk up. I go, hi, Chief Paul Solman, Rescue 2. I said, do you know where I'm going uh, to the flip class? He goes, you know, Paul, I can't remember where we put you. I know right there I'm dead. Right there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there's 15 of us, right? There's 15 guys, and he knows, he knows where the Rescue 2 guy's going. I get on my phone. I call Jimmy Yakimovich. Jimmy Yak is plugged into everything, right? He knows everything. He does. He calls the chief of the transfer desk, whoever. I don't even know who it is. Says, calls me back 60 seconds later, says, you go into the first division. I said, okay. I'm, that's not in my comfort zone. I have the utmost respect for all firemen, Manhattan firemen, but I don't want to go to, I don't want to go there. I call the firehouse, Galeon. Galeon is super tight with Carruthers as a driver. I said, Bobby, I'm going to the first division. He's like, what? I told this guy, you know, to, to take care of this. He said, I'm going to the first division. He says, okay. He calls up the driver and he's yelling at him on the phone. But the guy must be holding the phone and Carruthers is like, who's yelling at you? He said, it's Bobby Galeon. I was supposed to take care of the guy from Rescue too." So Carruthers says, ask him if Ruvalo is there. So Ruvalo happens to be there. He says, put Phil on the phone. So Ruvalo always handles everything perfect, right? Carruthers says, listen, Paulie ain't going back to Brooklyn. Now, in my mind, I was assigned to the 6th Division. I was assigned to the 7th Division. I was never assigned to the 15th Division. Uh, I got what you're saying. Division. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, got I didn't you. know. 
I said, all right, I was never assigned. Yeah, I'll go to the fifteenth. They won't let me back to the sixth or the seventh. So Carruthers says he can't. He's not going to the three, eight, the fourth, whatever I put in for. So Ruvalo goes, ah, oh, no, no, chief. He put another paper in through Flips. He would just love to go to the 16th Battalion in Manhattan. Carruthers says, oh, okay. Five minutes later, my phone rings. It's Yak. Yak goes, listen, the personnel guy just called me. He goes, your boy's weight just kicked in. Carruthers just left. He's going to the 16th Battalion. Oh, shit. The next day I go to class. I got promoted with a guy named John Norbert. John Norbert is a 120 guy. His father either worked with or broke in Carruthers. I'm not sure of the connection. I tell John the story. And John's like, oh, fuck. You know, I, I, I better find out. Well, it turns out John's going with me to the first division. So he obviously got it switched. The last day of flips, we go to the bar. And they come in with the assignment, right? So everybody runs over to the bar where they're going. And me and John are sitting at the bar. And they're like, you guys want to know where you're going? And I go, oh, I'm going 16th Battalion. And John's like, oh, the 5-1. They're like, you motherfuckers, you know? So, <laughs> you know? so uh, Galeon and Ruvalo saved me there. Now, I go up to the 6th Division. You can't – it's the greatest place to work. Um, 16th – I'm assigned to the 6th Battalion. I go to 27 truck. Um when I'm in flips, I'm going to go just tell a quick story. I'm in flips, me, Joe Light, Kevin Yost, and there's another guy in the class. One of the SOC chiefs come out to, to flips and pulls out of the class. They said, we want to bring you three guys back to SOC, but you're going to have to do something for us. Joe Light says, no, it was, okay, that's it. That's the connection. So the SOC chief comes out. He says, we want to bring you three guys back. You gotta, you gotta do something for us. Joey Light says, "I'll do the, the rescue, rescue school. school." Joe Light's a yeah. super guy. He's probably got thirty years of the job. He's been in rescue three forever. I love Joe Light. Awesome guy. Kevin Yos, excellent guy. He was the valedictorian of my class of uh, for flips. He says, "I'll do hazmat," and I say straight out, "I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it." So, let me just say the guys that I look up to: Steve Louise, Chris King, Danny Murphy. They were all told me getting promoted. There's an adjustment to make. You're not, you're not a fireman now. You're a lieutenant. My feeling is I'm not going to make that adjustment sitting at a desk pushing papers. So I said, I'm not going to do it. I just did 11 years. I did, well, I did 11 years in SOC. I said, if that's not enough, then I, I, I'm not. He goes, well, then you're not coming back to SOC. I said, okay, then I won't come back to SOC. That's how the conversation went. I go to, I, I think I gave a wise ass remark, like I'll land on my feet, which I shouldn't have said, but I was a little pissed. So I, I, I just walked away. I come out of flips. I go to 27 truck. Now my first run, this is again, my first run is a phone alarm for a fire on a day tour. They're calling me on the radio. I'm trying to read the ticket. I'm trying to get my mask on. Right. And I got some 35 year chauffeur looks at me with this crusty look and he goes, Hey, look, you know what? And he goes, you want to put the fucking siren on? I'm like, oh. and, and I'm fumbling now. Like in the beginning, I'm fumbling a little bit, you know, I call up Steve Louise, always the guy, my go-to guy, my mentor. I go, Steve, I'm fucking this up. I go, I'm like fumbling. He goes, Paul, we all do that. He goes, that's why I told you, you're not going to learn by pushing papers. You got to go back to your roots, the first few boxes. I said, he goes, this is what he said to me. I'll never forget it. He goes, I guarantee you in a few weeks, you'll be reading the ticket, sliding into your mask, answering the radio with your foot going on the pedal. An hour later, I called Danny Murphy. I have the same conversation. I don't even tell him I called Louise. And Danny Murphy's a super lieutenant, awesome boss. He says the same thing to me. We all fumbled in the beginning. It's an adjustment. You're going to, in a few weeks, it's going to be like, you know, and he, they were right. On your groove. Right. You're not going to do that by pushing papers. So I do my vacation in 27 truck. And then once again, I'm blessed. Here we go. The phone. Hold on. Right. Gonzo. Ching, ching. Ding, 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 ding. Which one do you want? Seven, seven, seven. Winner. (laughs) Yeah. I'm I'm definitely lucky. Winner. The phone rings. It's Dougie Gert. Now, I know Dougie Gert a little bit from the Bronx. He's the captain of 28. He has a sick career. 
He's the captain of 28. He was the lieutenant in 43 truck. And he was a fireman in 44 truck. He's like a, a tremendous fireman, you know? He goes, listen, one of my guys just tapped out. Bobby Carberry just tapped out. I'm bringing you here, UFO. I said, I just got promoted like a few weeks ago. He goes, I don't give a fuck. You're coming here, UFO. I'm like, okay. I go to 28 truck. I swear to you, a, an, a week later, I run into the stock chief who I had that conversation with. I'm not going to say who it was. And I, I see him. He sees the 28 front piece. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm UFO in 28. I told you I'd land on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have said it once again, but anyway. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Why go into this situation now? Like Doug Girk, the captain of 28, Kevin Flanagan, who's a rescue three guy, a 59 truck, a great officer is in 28 truck as a lieutenant, and Brian Davin, who's a 120 guy. Brian Davin is now the commander of the 19th Battalion Chief. His brother, Richie, has been a 23 truck from 123. The Davin brothers probably had 80 years combined in the, in the service because they were cops before. Wow. So I'm working with Brian Davin, Kevin Flanagan, and Doug Gert. In the engine is Jeff Sims from 58 Engine, a great captain, and Ray McCormick. You know, you probably know Ray from the circuit. Yeah. Ray's a super officer, great guy. I step into this primo situation. Upstairs in the chief's office is John Newell, who obviously I know who's super great. If I have any questions, obviously I can go to John. And again, now Chief Donnelly is the battalion commander, my lieutenant from 58. Down the block is Jimmy McCluskey and EJ Teeny and Kirk Lester. And oh, I'm in 20 oh, okay. yeah. Right. So now I'm, I'm adjusting, but 28 truck, they have great guy. Dave Guzik is there, super senior guy. Eddie Ann's alone, the top is there, a senior guy, uh, Brian Outs. And then my favorite guy, who was my chauffeur, is Paul Nigro. Paul Nigro and me was one of my best friends to this day. I love Paul Nigro. He was my chauffeur, seriously hardcore fireman, tough as nails fireman. He's driving me. And they have tremendous accountability in 28 Truck. Like, you better be doing what you're supposed to do. They're highly, they've been highly motivated for 50 years. You never have to I say I was just going to say, there are, there are firehouses that they're great firehouses, but right. there's a handful of firehouses that are just, that, that's they one. Have of them, steep, they have a steep tradition. Right. Those, those guys and the middle guys there, like that's what was impressive. John Tobin, who's a lieutenant in Rescue One now, who had just a tremendous sense of right and wrong. <laughs> Huge guy, great irons guy, John Bardak. Uh, with the rescue one, this guy Danny Sullivan, who's now the captain of 26 truck. Uh, they had all the young guys, they, uh, Danny, Danny, uh, Cudlack, he was the captain of 120, he's the chief now. Greg D'Amato, lieutenant in 33, chief now. Brendan Hagen, Al Hagen's son, the 28, he's the captain of 33. You didn't have to say nothing to these guys, these guys were drilling on their own, they wanted to drill like on BI, we'd go to vacant buildings, we'd be cutting roofs. They were great. And, and then Nigro, these guys, they they set the tradition, you know. Um, I had one one great story with Nigro. Nigro's driving me. They're giving me uh, numerous addresses. They're like, you know, we're going down Edgecombe Avenue, and Nigro's driving me. He drives hard. He's, you know, we're driving hard. And they give me, like, four addresses. And I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. You have numerous calls. You got a fire. So Nigro goes, well, which address do you want me to go to? I said, just pull up the front of the building right there with the fire blow out the <laughs> He's like, oh shit. And he went to the along, he's like a roaring duck. You don't need an address. Just go right there. I want to go to so, that fire over there. <laughs> so I, I thought so much of Niagara that when I went back to Rescue 2, I asked Phil for one favor. And I said, I want to bring my chauffeur with me, this guy Niagara. He's, he's an excellent, he'll be excellent. And he, he, he did. And Paulie came over to Rescue 2 and he finished his career in Rescue 2. So uh, that's awesome, man. And, so you got uh, to work yeah, with him again. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I, I just I had a, I had a great run over there in 28. Um, I was not supposed to get the spot, so the spot was supposed to go to Rex Mars, and I was told that you're going to come here and hang your hat. Rex is getting the spot. I said, Oh, great! I'm I'm learning from these guys a lot of different things. You know, they showed me a lot of different things. It's a different neighborhood. Uh, I love talking to Ray Mack and talking to Kevin Flanagan. Um, yeah, I, I and I wasn't going to get the spot. And then Bobby Carberry retires, 
And Chief Donnelly says, listen, do you want the spot? I said, of course. Yeah, I want the spot. I 100% want the spot. He goes, okay. Chief Donnelly is very good friends with Bobby Morris Sr. They came on the job together. They went to 73 Engine together. Dougie Gert says, listen, I'm going to stay out of it. Whatever happens, happens. And I said, yeah, that's that's cool. I, and if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. I said, okay. Um, Bobby Morris Sr. is a total great gentleman about it. He says, you want Paulie? We're out. I see Rex like a week later. He goes, I'm not even going to put it for it. They want you. you. And, I, and I get the spot. Right after I get the spot, Jimmy Dale takes over sock. Right? He takes over sock. He calls me. I'm bringing you back to sock. I, said, I, <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> well, two things. One, I said, well, one of your chiefs, who I'm going to, is going to be nameless, says, I can't come back to sock. He said, you'll do what I fucking say. I say you're coming back. You're coming back. I said, two, I just made a commitment to Doug Gert. Right, 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 right. I'm right. not leaving. I made a commitment. I'm not leaving. He goes, that I understand. Jimmy Daly and Dougie Gert were. Off, we're, we're firing together, said, I'm staying in the 28 truck. And I stayed there for four years. I had a great time. I went to great fires. Um, Paul, I was just going to tell you this. This is j- just to get back, not to cut you off, but Dennis Murphy, right? Rescue 2 guy, right? One of my favorite guys. One of the most influential guys in my career. When I got promoted, I got promoted in 2002. He said to me, don't rush back. Because like you said, they needed guys back in sock. He said to me, don't rush back. Go, go out, be, learn to be a boss. When you come right. back, if you want to come back, you'll be that much better. And like you, you said it exactly, like that, that, it was like the perfect thing for me to do. I was out for whatever, seven, eight years. I was yeah. in, in 103. And, and I, I'm going to tell you that it, it, bo- it always bothered me. And not about myself, but I'll give you an example. You, you went out, you got 103. Mike Brady, who was a, one, was a, was a great guy, who got 102. Tommy Bone, who, who's a super, is a 108. Went to 111, right? Uh, Tommy Daly went to 111. Mark Gregory went to 111. I went to 28 truck. This was the real mind blow. Vinny Ungaro, who's a super guy. 235. 235, because he says, so you, because you're holding everyone hostage now, you, you know, you, you, and, and I can understand that they had to, I get the, the premise because I talked to chiefs about it. Well, we got to do these schools. And I said, I get the premise. You have guys who are coming out of sock. Why can't they do the school? Let them pay the penance. And I'll use this guy as an example. And, I'm, and I think the guy's a great guy, not a good guy, a great guy, Ray Strong. Ray Strong came from 111 into sock. He's a great fireman. He's a great officer, but he had to pay his penance. He didn't come from sock or Daryl Couch, super guy. He was a lieutenant, he was a captain now. He came from 103 and 290. Why does a guy like Tommy Bone, who did 10 years in a rescue company, have to pay his penance? So you lost them, right? You lost them. They lost you. They lost all these guys. And I never could understand that premise. I just couldn't get it, you know? So when I told Jimmy Dale, and Jimmy Dale's like, no, 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 no. I'm in charge. You want to come back? I said, I'm not going to go back. So what happens now, I'm there for a while. Dougie Gert gets promoted to chief. Mike Hayes comes. Super guy. I love Mike Hayes. Was a fireman there. And maybe like six months later, Ruvalo calls. Says, you want to come back to rescue too? Now, I'm not an idiot, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm definitely, my wife would tell you I'm stupid, but I'm not an idiot. So, I might have been born at night, but not last night. <laughs> I said, yes, well, I would love to come back. So in the interim, I think Jimmy Ellison had the spot. He it lasted a year. He's out. Liam comes in. He lasts a year. He's out. They both, they both got to get promoted. So Phil says, okay. He said, Freddie's going to, you call Freddie. He goes, keep, this is what he said. He goes, keep your mouth shut. You're going to pay your penance and you're going to just keep your mouth shut and do what they tell you. I go, okay. I call Freddie and I'm, I'm friendly with Freddie. You know, I, I love Freddie. He's the boss. He goes, listen, I'm going to put you in the boats. You got to go to the boats. I said, okay. So I go to Marine One. I'm in this guy's spot who's in rescue school. I forget his name. I'm there six weeks. It's fine. They treat me great. I hang out at the boat. My wife comes in with my son. We go out on the big boat around the yeah. you know, city. <laughs> they take my son out on, out a on the boat. boat. <laughs> my, son, my son's like five years old. He's driving a speedboat. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and then they tell me, I said, okay, I'm done with that. They say, you're going to hazmat now. I don't know anything about hazmat, but I'm going to be with you guys. I live in Middle Village. 
So I'm about a hundred. Yeah, it's right there. Right, right, right. Okay. I go to hazmat. I remember telling the guys in hazmat when we go on a run, you guys just go do that hazmat shit. I'll, <laughs> I'll talk to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hang out there. Uh, then I was SA for a little while. Freddie was going to put SA. I'm working in companies I never heard. You know, I go to some engine somewhere. I don't even know where I am. Uh, and the senior guy goes, "Listen, uh, Lou, we got BI today." I said, "Well, my brother, not today. We don't. We're not going." You know, I was there to pull up. Oh. I said, we're not I'm going. Saying, like, Who's kind of guy? Like, what do you want for lunch? You know, and I'm like, I said, yeah. So uh, I didn't know, you know, what are you going to do? Send me back to the sixth division? I'm like, you know, I just laughed. Back then it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too bad, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Then I went to Rescue 4 with Joey. And and Joey said, you know, Joey's has a spot. He goes, you want to stay here? You, you, know, you can have the spot. I said, no, no, no. I'm going to go back to Rescue 2. He goes, well, you can stay here then. You can sit tight. I said, no, it's not right. Uh, I'm going to go bounce. I'm not taking the spot. Give it to Mike Galgano or someone that you want in the spot. I think Dennis Gordon got the spot. Or maybe even Dennis. Right. Dennis took it. Yep, yep. That um, was about the time he took they're it. They're a much senior guy to me. They've been promoted away. I said, I'll. And then maybe two weeks later, Freddie goes, all right, you're going to Rescue 2. So I go back to Rescue 2. Chief and, Daly's uh, in the uh, chat, Paul. He said, Paul, he's a rule breaker, LOL. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had a yeah. I'll tell you another story later with Jimmy Dale. I love Jimmy <laughs> Dale. But yeah. So uh, I go back to rescue two. My first run, Jimmy Jagger driving me. My first day, let's say, my first day, Jimmy Jagger driving me. Me and Jimmy are super tight. We get in an accident. We get T boned on Empire right in front of the police precinct. I do the paperwork. You know, like all that bullshit. I do the paperwork. I go into the police precinct. I do the paperwork. Uh, it's all done. We go to pull the rig out. The whole suspension, the rig just falls in the street. I'm like, oh, we got to get towed. And once again, like, he looks at me. He goes, you're getting thrown out of here on your first day, you know. I got to call Ruvalo now. I call Ruvalo. I go, hey, Phil. He goes, I already know. You know, he's like, he always knows. He always knows. He might like, know we crashed, but you don't know. We got to change the rig in the middle of the street. We're getting towed away, you know. So I get the spot. Um Here's the, here's a good, a funny story. I get the spot and Freddie Lafamina is in headquarters and he says he's talking to Chief McNally and Chief McNally says to him, that's good that you gave a guy from 28 truck rescue too. He goes, everybody thinks it's fair. It's not, you know, it's fair. Everyone has a shot. And Freddie's like, okay. He doesn't know him from rescue too. He, he just thinks that a guy from 28 truck got it. Carruthers oh, knows shit. He didn't know that? And he goes, yeah, Chief, right. You know, he tells me later. He goes, you're not going to believe this. He says, they, <laughs> they think you're from 28. They don't know you're going back. <laughs> yeah. I was going to so. say, what the heck? Paul, you know what I want to ask you quick? What? How was it? Because I know how it was for me to go back as lieutenant to 2 still my question, Lou. Oh, how dare go you? Ahead, Mike. Go ahead, baby. <laughs> I was gonna well basically it was gonna be the same verbiage as Lou in that it's one thing to be a rescue firefighter. It's an entirely different thing to be a rescue boss. Whole different ball game. Right. And you had been a lieutenant in a pretty good truck, but to be a lieutenant in rescue, especially a company you have so much history with, what was that like for you? Was it a difficult transition? Well, first of all, I couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? I, I'm a guy that came from 34 engine. I don't know anything about the fire department. And you know, I'm, I'm going back to, to rescue two. Um, another great, you know, another great guy that I'm working is Danny Murphy. You know, like if I, you know, like Danny Murphy is an unbelievable fire officer. You know, I want to go back for one thing. I forgot to talk about this. It is my boy Danny and Liam. <clears throat> um, I just want to backtrack for one thing because I had one, I had a lot of great nights in the, in the New York City Fire Department, but this was my best night in the New York City Fire Department was the night of the blackout. I don't know if you guys remember, there was a blackout in New York. Um, Danny Murphy is the, the officer and Stan is driving. It was uh, August 14th of 03. So Danny's the boss. I have the can. Stan's driving. Billy Espo has the irons and Billy Eisenberg. And in 24 hours, we went to 25 jobs. 25 jobs. We worked at 15 of them. We were first through to five jobs. And uh, Danny was the boss. And, you know, there's no better. He's as good a fire officer as anyone you'll ever work with. I remember the first fire we went to was in Brownsville. And the chief in the, in the 4th Force said, hey, Danny, go up and check the, the fly ash uh, collector. And Danny's like, uh, no, chief. First of all, there's no power, you know. And he goes, why? You got a better something better to do? He goes, yeah, there's a fire coming in every 60 seconds, you know. Like, 
So the chief goes, ah, get out of here. And we got a, a box down the block, a frame. We pulled it first through, with, you know, and we went to 25 jobs in That's 24. Crazy. That's crazy. That's some guys do it a year, you know. And first two, five jobs. Danny had a big burn on his neck. I was, my calf was burnt. Billy Espo's eyes were swollen shut. And Billy Espo's brother was the deputy. And he saw us. He goes, you boys are having way too much fun. And they held the day crew over. And uh, we wouldn't let him on the rig. And they're like, nah, we're, we're going to ride this whole thing. I, mean, I ended up working for the force. If they didn't get the lights on the next night, they'd have burnt the city down. That's that was they were going wild, you know, all over the city. But we, I think Eddie so Curley, they, uh, 103 got a medal that, that night. I think they had a oh, yeah. job too over there. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. He's I a middle off. village boy too. Another middle yeah. village boy. So, yeah, I get promoted. So now I'm, you know, I'm with George Hassel and I'm with Danny Murphy and like, you know, and Phil. So I got to do straight tours, which I don't care. I'm in middle village. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm just, it's it just, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, man. Just, it does a lucky situation, you know, and, you know, I'm working with Galeon. So to answer your question now, so it, it wasn't that big an adjustment for, for a couple of reasons. One, I was out four years and a lot of the guys I worked with were gone. The guys that I were there, wasn't a problem. Woody, Bobby Galeone, you know, like those guys stand. The rescue two is runs itself. You don't have to stay too much. It's great senior guys. All the new guys that they brought in, it was never an issue. I, it was funny. Phil brings me up in the office when I get the spot. He goes, listen, you're not one of the boys no more. You know, they're hanging out in the kitchen and all that shit. And I said, no problem. I said, but I'm not telling Galeone what to do. So he laughed. He goes, I don't tell Galeone what to do. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I, I, I had no issues and the other thing was i knew all the chiefs you know i had to report all the chiefs from being a fireman and, and the other thing is and i i always thought this and i think danny would agree with me that the, one of the reasons that uh, that a lot of times the, the fine and come back to rescue too as as the offices is it's just an easier adjustment you know you kind of know how things are done you know the chiefs you have a rapport if, if they don't know you, man, it, it could get a little, you know, it gets edgy. They're going to, you know, so I think that it's an easier adjustment because I did work there. You know, I knew all the chiefs in the 3 8. I knew all the chiefs in the 4 4. I knew the deputies. They all knew me. So right. Was, they're more, they really feel comfortable. Right. right. It was an easier transition. Um, I never really had any really crazy issues with that, you know? So. Will Downey just got the spot back there too, right? To your point, Will right? Downey's, He's a fireman there. Yeah, Will Downey's a great guy. I was happy he got the spot, and he deserved it, man. He's you know, yeah. And uh, and then Phil was there for maybe you know Phil's like I said, he's the best captain you could ever have, and uh, he taught everybody a lot. He always stuck up for his guys. He always looked out for me, and. Uh, then how lucky can we be that Phil gets promoted and who walks in the door is Liam, you know? So we're, we're just rolling along here. It's not like there's going to be a whole lot of changes here. Liam was a Lieutenant there. Liam knows everybody. I mean, he knows everybody. I mean, that, if and I were thinking it, about it's just a smooth transition, you know, that guy knows and everything. I have to say this about Liam. Liam, Liam uh, You'd be up in the office, and I'm telling you, Liam's phone to ring every 60 seconds with everybody. Somebody asking for a favor, you know? Liam, I need this. Liam, I need that. Like, And he never said no. Like, that guy has done more for the fire department than, than most guys. And he That's has sacrificed his own. He sacrificed his own personal life. The whole band, through the funerals, through 9-11. But even as the head guy in the band, Liam would always get guys for weddings and get guys for this and get guys for that. And he and he was getting favors from congressmen and from, from the chief of department and senator. Like, everybody's asking for a favor, and Liam would never say no, never. And I, I'm happy to say that Liam just got married recently. He just had a, a baby, you know. So he, it, he it's come full circle for him. And I'm trying to tell him, like, you know, retire and come down to Florida. You know, come down with us and play golf with me and Danny. You know. So yeah, Liam was, a, was he stepped right in. And then uh, Jerry O'Shea came, and Jerry O'Shea was another great guy. He was a 19 truck guy, uh, rescue four guy. Super God, we guy. have that. His father, his father's like a legendary guy from the Lower East Side during the war years. There they That's are. Jerry O'Shea and Danny, and we had a great office. Um, 
We never really had any issues. And and even when Phil was there, Phil would take us all in the office. When we had the R group, we would all go out to dinner together. We would always meet and, and discuss things and stuff. <clears throat> and one thing, like Phil would always ask us all our opinions. But when we came down the stairs, we were united. We were always united. That's important, I think, you know? I agree. Mm-hmm. You got to be united. And we were always united. Um, whether, you know, we agree with it or not. And Phil had a saying, and I loved it. He said, this ain't a democracy, boys. You, know, <laughs> you, know, you can give me your idea. Well, I would go, Danny, Phil says we can't do this. He's like, well, did he say we can't do it? Or did he was like, we can't do it. He said we can't do it, right? And me and Danny would joke around all the time, you know, and uh, yeah, we, but yeah, we, it, it was perfect transition and I didn't have any problems. And then like I said, I'm working with guys like Ronnie Broom and Richie Myers and all these great guys. And so I'll tell you a good that, Richie Myers story. That place is always going to attract the best, man, because it's, it's the busiest place on earth. I say it all the Top time. The line. Right? Yeah, it was busy. It was, it was definitely busy. And I think what makes Rescue 2 unique is we did a lot of first new work. We always did first to work, you know, plus everything else and all the emergencies. You know, we had the building collapses and the trenches and just they always do it something, you know. There's always you're always active, you know. And I, I, I actually fun. wanted to work in the new firehouse. I was I was hoping to work in the new firehouse, but I just didn't get a chance. You know? I was gonna say, you think the new firehouse is a better location than the old firehouse? I do. I do think it's a better location than I like down the block from 283, which is a super, super freaking engine, first new engine. Uh, they jump out, they get right on Eastern Parkway. Woody, Woody told me it's a better spot, you know? Yeah, because so they can Woody, get on the, the main drag right away, right? Woody's still in Rescue 2. I mean, Woody's been I just in Rescue 2. <laughs> Holy, Woody's in Rescue 2 25 years. Yeah, he's wow. Woody would have been a great boss, man. I said, you should have studied. He would have been a great boss. He's a tough Woody's a hard track, dude, man. Man. Oh, my God. We were, going to, we we're going to Flatbush one time on... We're going to a job in Flatbush. It's like four in the morning and there's people trapped and Woody's on it, man. Like he's on it. You know, we're like, you know, we're, we're flying. So I, I'm like, you know, you're sitting in the seat, like you got no control. So I said, Woody, he goes, what? I go, I'm going to close my eyes and keep hitting the pedal. Let me know when we get there. You know? <laughs> like this, you know? so That's like, about hey, how it feels like at 290. <laughs> oh, 290. Yeah, 290s. Oh, yeah. shit. My buddy from. My friend from 71 Engine, Kevin Tully, is working at 290. Kevin Tully is a crazy dude, man. Hardcore yeah, engine guy, weird. good nozzle man. He says he's working at 290 one day, and they're going to a third new guest league. Oh. There's the show for BB down Pennsylvania, and he says he uh, he says to the guy, you know we're going to a third new guest league, right? And the guy goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> and <he's> like, <laughs> we're here, 1084. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was going to say this, too. Like, when a uh, – at the show yesterday, I met uh, a good friend of mine, Nicky Salmonis. I always felt like he was one of the best chauffeurs that I ever saw drive. And then I saw Jimmy Gersbeck driving. Like, yeah, he used Jimmy to drive Gersbeck. 103, like, incredible. Like, really, like, incredible. So and, another 103 guy who I forgot to say was, was uh, got killed 9-11 was Danny Labretti. And I know he was a really three guy. Yeah. I'm glad about Danny. You know, Danny, I shouldn't have, but. Yeah, Danny was a great guy. He came over. He had to go out and teach probie school because we had to do probie school. And then he gets killed on 9 11, you know. So, so he was a, yeah, he was yeah, a great yeah. guy. He was a world class chef, too. Huh? A world class chef, too, I heard. Oh, God. He was a sick. He was a trained chef at a culinary school. Yeah. Yeah, Danny. Yeah, Danny was a super guy. And he was really tight with Pete Romeo and Woody. You know, they were all 290, 103. And yeah, they, were, they had like a. Uh, they would bang nails on the side. They were all really super talented guys. So, yeah. And that, and then, I mean, the worst, one of the worst, I had a couple of really bad jobs as a lieutenant. I'm just going to tell you the one, the one I had was by, they used to have the kids used to ride the, the roll down gates and they would, the last kid to let go would be like, you know, like the, the, the brave kid. So we get a job in East New York right by 103. The kid hangs on, the gate rolls him up and breaks his neck and kills him. He's probably eight or nine years old. We get there, 103 has the rig under the kid. Takes us a little while, we get him out. And it's it's one of the worst calls I ever went on. The family's going wild, obviously. Their son is killed. Uh, it's it's a terrible call. Woody's son is riding with for the day. He's sitting in the cab watching this. So we come back and we critique the job. Like we would always critique the job. I said, this is a once in a lifetime, you know, we're not gonna get this again, but let's talk about it. We go over it. 
One week later, we get the same exact call, the same call up in Williamsburg. And maybe a half an inch from killing the kid, somebody puts their hand in front of the beam. So we get in, the kid is rolled up in the gate, his head's rolled up in the gate, and all you see is his feet flailing like crazy. But me and Woody had the job again, and we knew, basically, and we got him out fast. You know, we were able to clear his head. Woody got in with the clamshell. We knew what the tools to use, and we got him out. We saved the kid, and, and it was a good outcome, you know. We ended up getting like an award. We got that picture, Guns. Yeah, oh, that was a, that medal. Okay. My mistake was in yeah, that. Yeah, so we got like an award, like we saved this kid. and This is a better picture. Yeah. So Where's the Woody, kid? We had a picture uh, of the kid. You know, I, yeah, it was good. I mean, that kid – was probably a quarter inch from being killed, I would say. He was going to – and it was just weird. Like, you think you – it was a once-in-a-career job, and then me and Woody were, like, looking at it. So, like, we, you know, the guy on the right here was the first through truck officer, and that's Lieutenant Ambellis. Ambellis. Who unfortunately, got killed in a fire. And uh, yeah, as soon as I saw that picture, I said, I remember him. I said, yeah. I don't remember the name, but I remember him. And then we had that – and then I had the 107 rig, and they flipped the rig. Remember that, Louie? I do. That was bad too, man. That was bad. So that took us a while to get him out. And uh, he was really trapped. We, 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 we uh, he was wrapped around a tree. Eddie Morrison was working. Eddie's a super guy. Oh, Eddie really Morrison, really man. He's a great guy, man. Really sharp guy. He got his one leg out fast. We're trying to get him out. We, we, we couldn't get him out. We ripped the air conditioning out of the rig. We ripped the communications out of the rig. We just can't get the angle. Rescue 4 came in. And I said, you got to get this. We called a tow truck. Um, we call, had to call the department mechanic. And I'll never forget this. Patty McAvoy from 174 is the ABC. And the guy's starting to crash a little bit. They, they give him an IV, but he, he's not looking good. And I said, Patty, start out a surgeon from the hospital. He goes, why? I go, because we're not going to let this guy die. If we have to, we'll cut his leg off. He, he looked at me like I had, like I was crazy. But he goes, all right. Because we, you know, we're, we're in East New York. There's a hospital. I go, Get a surgeon down. They did. They got a surgeon down there because I really thought he was going to die. We, we just couldn't get him out. We tried everything. Um, and what happened was Rescue 4 did come in. I said, you got, we've got to get this rig off the trick. So they took they took two grip hoists and they made mechanical vendors and they were able to pull him off the tree. Then we pulled the grill out. And we were able to get through the grill. And Eddie checked him with the air edge, lifted the rig, and we were able to get him out. So that was a hairy job. And one of our own guys, you know. So when was that? That was you remember the years that was? That was later, right? I, I think I was out. Years. I think I was out of 103 by then. I don't, I don't, you know, but you know, I had a good run, man. I had a good run. Bro, I was lucky. bro, you did amazing it. career. For a guy who knows nobody with the 34 engine and <laughs> Al Torrey saved my life. I, 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 mean, got, usually I got to work with guys like Timmy Higgins and Danny Murphy and Bob Gallion and you know, just. John Newell, and, you know, Paul Niagara, guys like that. Man, I, I, I'm blessed, you know. Yeah. I'm really blessed. Nah, it was well. you, you definitely. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that we've been going and we used to see you all the time when I was at 288. We used to see you, you know, by the park, or we see you by the deli over there if we go to eat all the time. Always, a gentleman, Paulie. Yeah, Lieutenant, I wanted to ask you this earlier, but you were on a roll, and I didn't want to stop you. And that is, you know. I remember Phil Rulo talking about this and still writing that after 9-11, he said, listen, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll love the job again, but it's not going to be as – I mean, I'm paraphrasing. It's not going to be as much fun because you're not working with those guys anymore. Unfortunately, they gave their lives. So when would you say after that time you learned to love the job again? I, I would say when I got promoted and something it was something new, a new focus, something different. You're not in the firehouse seeing the pictures, seeing the plaques, wearing the hood that says all the guys' names on it. You know, I got away from it a little bit, you know, and, you know, things calmed down, you know. I mean, after 9-11, like me, like every fireman, I wasn't home for a year. I was essentially at a funeral, working at the pile, working at the firehouse. I would say when I got promoted, and then I probably found that joy for the job again. Like, you know, listen, man. If there's reincarnation and there's a line, when I get online and they say, what do you want to do? You can do anything you want. You can be Jeff Bezos. I'm going to say, I want to be a New York City fireman, man. <laughs> it's just the greatest, you know, you like, know you, you, like Danny Murphy always says, you're with the greatest people. It's exciting. You know, it's just, it's a great job, man. It's fun. You don't make any money, but it's a great job. So, yeah. Good. I, I would do it all over again tomorrow. You may and not I be Richard Follett, but you're Richard Hart. 
I know Jimmy Gells and Joe Wiganiel and all my friends, Danny. We, we all say the same thing. We'd all do it again tomorrow in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. you know? But now, Wait, you still, don't... now you're hitting them, you know, 250 down the middle. You know what I mean? Right. Now no, it's all I'm right. Hitting now it's okay. I'm, hitting it, I'm hitting it 180 in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> And then my, and my partner, Danny Murphy, said they're 180 in the water to the other side. So I'm coming down. Gotta, I'm coming down. Me and I Danny have a tea time. We live in Naples, Florida now. So me and Danny have a tea time tomorrow at 825. Nice. I got to come yes. down. You got to come down. Hit the ball around. Yeah. No, yeah it's, it's, listen, the fire department's a young man's job, man. You know, so yeah. I've had I had three major surgeries post not, you know, post the fire department. And I don't have one friend who hasn't had surgery. Not one. Every guy I know. Has, no, I agree. Has, yeah. You know, so all right, we're gonna uh, we're gonna run with the old school tip of the day. Oh, God. oh, it's at that time. It is that time. It is that time for the old school tip of the day. Day, day. I actually hit the wrong button there. Del dia. <laughs> there you go, my friend. Have a all right, all right so I'm gonna try to hit a couple of things different. So I think Mickey Convoy said this, and it stood out in my mind, and I and. Uh, he said, good firemen have heart and balls, but great oh. firemen have heart, balls, and brains. And I, I believe that. I think you gotta have you gotta have balls, you gotta have heart, but you gotta think. When I think of the of the great firemen I work with, the Ralph, the Tizo or the Galleon or Ruvalo, they were all thinking, they were smart, they they had great instincts, you know. They all uh, they thought it out. They were they were they they were smart guys, not just aggressive guys. And the other thing that I, I thought about was an old time had told me, and I remember this was like, I think it was, it was really early on in my career. I think it was a rescue one guy actually. And he said, always give 110% always because some days things aren't going to go good. And you got to be able to look in the mirror and say, I gave everything. You don't want to like half ass it or you're flagging a box or you're not doing what you're supposed to. And then someone gets killed or a kid gets hurt. Or, or worse, one of our guys gets hurt, you know? So always give 100%, be squared away, latch on to the doers and the guys who have knowledge and and uh, and enjoy your career, man. It goes fast. And, you know, I loved every second of it, even the bad stuff. And I wish I could do it again. But for those guys out there that are doing it, man, just enjoy it because it's a special job. And I, I'm a believer that most people can't be firemen. 99% of people can't be firemen. So we're the 1%. So embrace it, man. It's the best job in the world with the best people in the world. That's all I got, boys. Good stuff, Paulie. That's a great – uh, those are two good tips, man. Yeah, it was uh, we used to say a different all the time, breed of individuals. We used to say all the time, you would go to a gas leak, and we would go check the hydrant, you know, uh, on, the, on that run, right. and go back to the firehouse. And if the same box came in, you were getting the same exact effort – to that same exact hydrant, to the same exact yeah. box, to the same exact thing every time, the same way. And we would tell, I would tell the chief, <clears throat> I'm gonna, we'll do that seven times in a row. If it comes in the same way, I'm going to be in the same exact spot and doing the same exact thing. So, right, because if you're setting that rig up on for the BS, then you'll be setting it up for the real stuff. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Right, and that's why well, I was got that. Yep. Incredible, incredible, incredible podcast, brother. Thank you so much. I, Thanks, uh, fellas. I appreciate no it. I'm glad we finally got you. I really am. It was great to. Yeah. I, I learned a lot about you. I mean, I knew you a long time, and I learned a lot about you. So it was good stuff. Uh, just yeah, hang loose. We're going to uh, run a quick ad, and then uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. All right, let's get the first responder. The First Responder Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding to the challenges to the health safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders, too. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. Tonight's health and safety tip is um, for those every once in a while who love a good chicken palm, you may want to put that aside. So eating a healthy meal is not difficult as it would seem. Just a few smart choices in your diet can make you a big difference or a big change in how you eat. So just try to eat a little healthier when you're out there, you know, kind of thing. So you got something you want to add, Mikey? I want to no, do, uh, I great. have a shout out. I want to just mention Bobby Beckwith uh, passed away today. We have a picture of him. One of the most oh. iconic pictures ever. Uh, 
he was a 117 guy. And uh, I just wanted to uh, give our condolences to the family. And uh, we met the big, uh, the big, that, that was a great picture at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was a very, uh, uh, what was it, motivating? I mean, look at the guys in the background. I mean, you remember, you could just tell it was like uh, the country was together then, you know, just from that one picture too, you know? Yeah, definitely, for sure. But so rest in peace, brother. Yes, rest in peace. And uh, we do have one throwback picture of Paulie. Uh oh, what do you got? <laughs> it's a good one. It's just one of those ones. Ready, buddy? Look at that picture. Look at that, man. Remember those guys? <laughs> yeah, that was my ball. Oh, wow, look at that. Stash. I joined the college. Oh. That was pretty funny. Look at yeah, that, that stash. That's why I wanted to share it because that's I was uh, I remember some of these guys. This was my time back in the day with Paul. You know, it was very short time. But, but yeah, are you in that picture? No, the oh. uh, chief gills <laughs> couldn't find um, <coughs> I, I, all these guys. I volunteered with the high school. A lot of these guys, but these were all guys that stayed there after me. So, but uh, I just wanted to share that with Paulie. That's it. All right, kid. Paul, again, appreciate it, man. Incredible career. I cannot say enough uh, about you. Hopefully, I'll get to play some golf with you soon. We might come down yeah. there for uh, St. Patty's Day in Naples again. So, hopefully, I'll run into you. I'll be in yeah. touch. Uh, and that's it. So, uh, Thursday, we're going to be off. We have a couple things going on, Kevin and I. So, uh, we'll see you guys on Monday, next Monday. And that's it. So, I will see you guys at the, see you at the big one. All right. Very briefly, I just had a shout out. And of course, it's always, as always, to all my peeps at the West Haven Fire Department, and especially because he was texting me earlier and he'll love this. I'll see him Wednesday because it's his shift. Brian Elliott, shout out to you, my brother. I will see you Wednesday for the D shift. And in the meantime, on behalf of Paul Soman, Anthony Gonzalez, and Louis Profrano, I'm Mike Cologne. We will see you next time. Stay salty, my friends. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Remember, hook up and look up, baby. Have a good oh. night. <laughs>